Muted. Unmuted. Muted. Unmuted. Good morning. Uh, the City of Tampa's Community Redevelopment Agency meeting is called to order on this uh, ninth day of March, 2023. Um, Councilman Carlson, I believe you have the invocation. Yes, good morning. Um, I have Rabbi Mindy here, who is, where is he? Right there, okay. Um, who we've had here many times, but I wanna welcome him back. Um, Rabbi Mindy was raised in Tampa, but left at 13 years old to study in Detroit, Paris, and New York City, where he received his rabbinic ordination. He has uh, in interned and volunteered in Argentina, Ukraine, Israel, and across the US. He speaks five languages and believes communication is his greatest tool. For the last 14 years, Rabbi Mindy has directed the South Tampa branch of Chabad, uh, the largest Jewish outreach organization in the world with over 3,800 branches in 80 countries. Rabbi Mindy coordinates uh, educational, social, and spiritual programs for thousands of people across the city of Tampa. His goal is to help people better connect with one another and their spirituality. To that effect, Rabbi Mindy also serves as the first ever Jewish chaplain to the Tampa Police Department and one of only a handful of Jewish chaplains uh, serving the FBI nationally. Um, so let's stand for invocation and then the pledge. Good morning. Let us pray. Ribono Shalom, Master of the World, look favorably upon this council, the Tampa City Council. Bless them with good health, wisdom, and compassion, that they may enact just laws according to your will. Bless these distinguished council members and their families, and let them remember that they have been chosen by thousands of people who have placed their faith and confidence in them to make laws and decisions on behalf of the residents of our great city. Let us all recognize that they hold a God-given position, the performance of one of the seven universal laws given to Noah, the father of all humanity, to ensure a peaceful and moral society governed by the rule of law. Bless our brothers and sisters in law enforcement and the military who constantly sacrifice for their freedoms, the freedoms that we cherish, protect them and return them safely to their families. Today, we open this council meeting just two days after the Jewish community celebrated the holiday of Purim, a festival commemorating our salvation from an anti-Semitic tyrant, Haman, under the Persian Empire in the fourth century BCE. Today, too, the Jewish community faces the scourge of anti-Semitism. Let all citizens of the city of Tampa accept and appreciate that our diversity as human beings is our greatest strength. And let us all see the unique and individual beauty that we contribute to the woven fabric of our society. Let us all find inherent goodness in each other and encourage one another to fulfill our charge from the Almighty, which is to protect and perfect this world under his sovereignty. In this way, we can all bring light in place of darkness, redemption in place of despair, and happiness and peace to all who seek it. And let us say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Carlson? Here. Vieira? Moscato? Here. Sechel? Here. Here. Goods? Here. Miranda? Here. Here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Massey. Uh, good morning. Can I also get a quick uh, motion to adopt the minutes from the February 9th CRA meeting? Thank you. Okay, I have a motion by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, this is a regular meeting of the City of Tampa Community Redevelopment Agency, or the CRA, held at 9 a.m. on March 9, 2023 in the City Council Chambers located in Old City Hall, 315 East Kennedy Boulevard in Tampa, Florida. The public is able to participate in this meeting during public for a maximum of three minutes per speaker, either here in person at Old City Hall or virtually by way of communication, media technology, or CMP. However, the use of CMP does require pre-registration with the City Clerk's Office. Directions for pre-registration are included in the notice of the meeting and on the agenda. Can I please have a motion waiving the CRA standard rules procedure to allow public participation by CMP? I have a motion by Board Member Good, seconded by Board Member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Good 
Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Nicole Travis, Administrator of Development and Economic Opportunity and your interim CRA director. We could go over the agenda real quick, Madam Chair. Um, we just found out that Kimberly Curtis' flight um, was delayed and she's unable to make it here in time for our presentation this morning. So okay. that's item number two. Okay. Item number nine, um, we've provided a written report and the handout presentation that was done for the accessory dwelling units um, with the East Tampa C uh, CAC. We're asking that that item stand on its own unless there was pulled for discussion. <clears throat> Board Member Goods, it's your... I think the public needs to hear about that. Okay. Uh, item number 10, am I asking that this item be continued until April, your April 13th CRA meeting? Um, this was a motion related to compensation, but it's really tied to your services agreement. We're working on the services agreement. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're working on that services agreement right now. The details with um, that we're working through right now is with the budget office. Since the last meeting, we you voted on restructuring um, the CRA staff, so we need the budget to align with that. So we just need until April to be able to do that. <clears throat> Board Member Goods. You know, I. Uh, I talked to Ms. Travis. She's talked to me several times about this, and she's a very humble individual and has asked me not to keep bringing it, bring it up. And I had a conversation with the Chief of Staff last night about this issue. Uh, I want to go ahead and go for the continuous. I won't be here after May 1st. And I was given a commitment that this will be done and handled. You'll get your pay. Mr. Drum will get their pay at the next CRA meeting. This should be done. I'm hoping that they keep their word because there's no way in the world you, should, should, you Mr. Drum, should not have been paid what you've been the work you've been doing uh, so I'm prayerful that it will get done and if it's not over the next council or CRA board will make sure that you and this gentleman get properly compensated because you've been doing a lot of work in the city I know y'all are burnt out you work in different jobs in this all over the city and it's not fair not right and again I know you've asked me not to talk and discuss about this but uh, it's my conscience my heart my mouth and I figure you need to be compensated like anybody else because anybody else probably would already got paid I'm just sorry to say that but I know they would have so, Thank you. I'll go with the continuous. I'll, I'll second it um, with the same caveat that I think we ought to resolve it at the next meeting. Okay. So I have a motion by uh, Board Member Good, seconded by Board Member Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number 11. Um, this is a motion uh, for the CRA to look into um, Memorial Park Cemetery. I, I'm asking you to continue this item because we are working on it. I have been in contact and have made an offer, <clears throat> extended an offer, and I would, I just ask that, respectfully ask that you continue this item until I can um, report something more concrete, please. Board Member Carl. Can I just ask one question? Are, I know the city is working parallel to the CRA. Yeah. So is the offer from the CRA or the city? Um, it's from the city. City, okay. Um, so you want us to continue until the next meeting? until I bring it back to you <laughs> with something more concrete. Otherwise, if it's not resolved by then, I'm gonna ask for a continuance again. I just would n prefer not to um, <clears throat> negotiate this in at the meeting. Could we just put he, it on the May agenda and then? Yeah. And then, um, That's fair. And then you can continue. And I could provide an update. I'll provide, I could be able to provide an update on what's the latest on that. I then. think it would just be good to, to have it on the agenda so that we don't forget it. and. And uh, the question is, it, what if the CRA can assist the city in, in any way? And so, if you'll just keep and that there is a way, and we, we would work towards. So towards I, that. I would like to move uh, move to continue item number eleven until the May CRA meeting. Okay, motion made by Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And finally, May, I, um, the May CRA meeting. Oh, sorry, I don't have. It is May uh, 11th. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then finally, item number 12. Um, this motion was made uh, when the downtown partnership was looking at expanding um, into the Ebor area. That has since um, went away. But we would still like to have the conversation with the Ebor um, CAC, we just are requesting more time to be able to do that. So we're asking for a continuance until June 8th um, to be able to have the, the time to have these conversations with the CAC. I'll move uh, to continue this to June 8th, please. Um, 
The only thing about that is I thought that that was the retreat date. I think you're right. <laughs> I so. think you're right. For one second. I think, Morris, we're okay in July too, right? Or is that, what's yeah. the deadline we're working against? No, no, I, I mean, there, we're fine continuing this until July. I mean, the, the process, if we move forward with a special services district for eboard mm -hmm. is that there has to be a study done and then a notice of intent hearing typically before January uh, 1st. It yeah. can be, that can be extended to March 1st with the, with the approval of the property appraisal and the tax collection. And I think I mentioned this the last time we discussed it, but um, there was a, just for the public, there was a discussion about including the Ebor, Ebor landowners wanted to be included in the special taxing district of downtown, which means they would pay more taxes, but they would get special services like clean team and other things. And then they decided to uh, go on their own and uh, and propose their own uh, special services district. So there's a there. This was being pushed quickly because it was a mm -hmm. deadline coming up. But now the deadline is not is not so urgent. So um, and the CRA, in in fairness, if it's a special taxing district, it's really not a role for the CRA staff to be involved in. But the, um, this should be the property owners. But if those conversations start to happen, we can see how the CRA can. Um, to your point earlier what services are not being offered, what services is the SSD going to take? Um, so Yeah, so the two, the two <clears throat> pieces, number one is that the CAC is a constituent, um, and so uh, the, the CAC chair and others have said that they wanna be informed about it, mm -hmm. they wanna be able to ask questions and give input, and so that's fair, but the other thing, as you were just alluding to, there are some services, like janitorial services yes. and others that are being paid now by the CRA, and if those move to the special services district, that would free up more money in the CRA. That's correct. So um, that it is, it is an important thing for us to look at. So Thank would you. you be willing to um, continue that to July twentieth, the July twentieth CRA? Um, yeah. Meeting? So I move to continue uh, item number twelve to July twentieth. Okay. I have a motion by Board Member Carlson, <coughs> seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Um, you have an, uh, a memo from. Um, Elise Drumgo to remove item number 17 from the agenda. Could I say one more thing about number 12? Sure. There, there's a, there's a, uh, I have not seen it, but apparently there's a map uh, by some of the landowners in Ebor that's circulating and they've gone parcel by parcel talking to people and the people that said they don't want to be included, they're carving them out. And so they're not looking to force anybody to pay more, but the people who want to pay more for more services will be able to do that. And that's their choice, not ours. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. So item number 17, I'm requesting to be removed from the agenda, please. Okay, I have a motion by board member Miranda, seconded by board member Goods. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Madam Chair, that's it for the agenda. Changes. Okay, we, um, we just need to go back to item two and re remove that from the agenda. If or continue it to next month, either one. Okay. That, whatever Which, is your pleasure. We would have to check to see if she's available, but if you go ahead and move it, I'll let you know otherwise. Okay. Can I ask one more thing? Sure. We've got, I, I see um, item number 18 and 22 are the uh, Tampa Theater, and we've got five or six folks from Tampa Theater here. It, so I'm going to present, um, under my director's report, there is, um, I think, item number six, where you asked me to look at the budget, I was going to make my presentation and then invite the theater to come up and do their presentation okay. at that time, at, at item number six. Okay, great. Thank you. So. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Uh, the, con the contract is, um, it's uh, 18 and 22, 18 and 22 would be heard together, but if you wanted to pull them, you can pull them and act on them after the um, theater's presentation. So, yeah. so move to put item number 18 and 22 after item number six. Second. Okay. So we, we are going to put items number 18 and 22 um, after item number six. Okay. Uh, motion made by Councilman Carl, or Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, I still need a motion to um, move item two. So moved. Okay. I have a motion to move item two to April 13th. Um, by board member Maniscalco and seconded by board member Goods. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Wanna, Thank you. Wanna, anyone want to approve? Okay. 
Uh, board member uh, Maniscalco moved to approve and uh, board member Carlson seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Uh, motion carries. Uh, so now it is time for public comments. Um, a public is welcome to comment on any item for up to three minutes. Uh, if anyone wishes to speak today, please, please <coughs> form a line. And Good morning, council members. My name is Jeff Shear. Uh, I'm an attorney with Chank Milioni Law Firm at 707 North Franklin Street, Tampa 33602. Um, I'm not here in a legal capacity this morning. I'm here uh, as the chairman of the board of the Tampa Theater. We, as, as uh, Councilman Carlson just mentioned, we have, a, we have an a, a agenda item up for consideration for you all this morning, and we have a few people here that would like to uh, ask for your support uh, in moving that, that motion forward. Um, and you'll hear more from John Bell, our executive director, when he makes our, pres uh, our presentation, but um, from the board perspective, we spend almost all of our time and efforts raising money to help maintain uh, a 97-year-old building. And as fast as we can get the dollars in, they seem to go back out. So we are now at finally uh, asking for support from the CRA to help with some of the bigger items um, that, that need addressing. We're coming up quickly on the theater's 100-year anniversary, which is in 2026, and we hope to have the theater um, in tip-top shape by that time. So um, again, we just ask for your support uh, to move that, uh, that item uh, forward and thanks for your consideration, appreciate it. Good morning, my name is Mike Hooker. I am also an attorney, but I'm also not here uh, for uh, uh, any legal capacity. Uh, I'm uh, a resident uh, here of Tampa 852 South Newport Avenue and I'm here to also to speak on behalf of the uh, Tampa Theater. We in Tampa uh, are fortunate to have experienced, obviously, a revitalization of the downtown area over the last uh, many years. Frankly, a, a beneficiary of that, but also a significant contributor, we think, is the Tampa Theater. As fantastic as it may seem, uh, the Tampa Theater was actually scheduled for demolition in the 1970s, and through the hard work of a lot of concerned citizens, and the city of Tampa it survived the wrecking ball and now is probably, uh, I think it's safe to say, as vibrant in terms of programming live entertainment, first run classic films as any time in the last uh, 50 years. Um, it's not always been that way, but it is now. So we think it's obviously a significant contributor to the culture of Tampa, but it's not just that. It's also a significant contributor to the historic uh, preservation and, and architecture uh, of the city of Tampa. When, when you walk in through those doors and see for the first time uh, that uh, iconic uh, balcony, uh, the courtyard scene, the, uh, the twinkling stars and the, and the faux sky above, you can't help but to be awestruck. It's truly a, an architectural marvel. Uh, for that, we owe a lot to a very famous uh, architect uh, out of Chicago, John Eberson, who once said that of all the movie palaces uh, that he did, uh, over his many years, Tampa Theater was his favorite. Uh, we actually had uh, uh, a very prestigious historic preservation firm come in a few years ago to help with the preservation of the lobby, scraping away the paint, finding the original hues and so forth. They told us of all the work they'd done on all these prestigious historic buildings in the country, the Tampa Theater was the best preserved and most original of all of these so-called atmospheric movie palaces in the United States. So we think, again, it's a very significant contributor to the culture and the uh, historic architecture of the city. As Jeff said, in three years, we'll be celebrating our 100-year anniversary. Uh, we've survived the first century. We want to ensure that we survive and thrive uh, over the next century. So for all those reasons, we really uh, hope that you will be generous in your support of the Tampa Theater. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, the, the line, the line is right here, so we're going to let the line go. Thank you and good morning. Um, Delphine Jones, 1518 West LaSalle Street. Uh, West Tampa CAC board member and also vice president of West Riffront Crime Watch Group. I'm coming here today to speak on the issue of the Soul Walk 
I've asked in the past to be contacted and let us know what phase we're in. I don't know where, what phase we're in, what they're doing or anything. But this is a sensitive item uh, and we want that soul walk to represent the neighborhood, Blake High School, the businesses that were there in the past. Um, we don't want other people input. And like I say, I don't even know what's going on the wall. So um, I need some information on that. As far as I know, it's a website up that says um, send in your pictures. Um, and, and that's not good enough. We need the person, whoever's in charge, to come to the community so it could be a home-rooted um, thing for people in the community. We don't want to be left behind. It's our community, so we want the face of the wall to represent that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Council, for um, all the effort you put in in bringing the Afro-American history back into the community. Board Member Goots. Ms. Travis, uh, can we make sure that the community is really notified? I mean, I, I didn't notify they had a ribbon cutting a, a ceremony a, a couple weeks ago. I, I, I guess I didn't get the invite, so I didn't know anything about it. So if you can make sure the community, Ms. Delphine, she's a big time West Temple person, and making sure that if CRE dollars are going to help to fund that, that we are able to make sure all communities are uh, well knowledge of that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I spoke to Ms. Delphine this morning. I gave her my card and Administrator wins contact information, and we're definitely going to follow up and make sure that they're kept in the loop. So thank you. Um, Board Member Carlson. Ms. Delphine, did, where did she go? <coughs> did, uh, did Robin call you yesterday? Robin and I. Um, I talked to Robin after we spoke yesterday, and, and then I also sent her, uh, Andrew, my aide, sent her your information. So not to my knowledge. If, she didn't call you, if she didn't call you, let me know, and we'll put you in touch with her. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Holly Reed. I live at 2059 Ronald Circle. Last time I was here, I mentioned that several bodies originally buried at Zion Cemetery were removed and reinterred in Memorial Park Cemetery. Most of the bodies that were buried at Zion weren't moved. They remained where they were and had buildings built over, built over them. They remain that way today. Zion's founder, Richard Doby, is among the 15,000 unmarked graves at Memorial Park. He built Zion as a dignified place for Tampa's black citizens to be buried. Unfortunately, the property was, with, was levied with such heavy taxes they could no longer afford to keep the property, and it was auctioned off by the city in 1915. It went through several owners until it was finally brought by property developer H.W. Fuller in 1926. In the following years, Fuller removed memorials, built storefronts, and sold off parcels of the land for other development. It wasn't all done over a night, but it was gradually done over a period of years. That is how the erasure of Zion Cemetery became one of the most shameful chapters in Tampa history. Part of this story was repeating itself with Memorial Park. It was bought by a property flipper whose only motivation is greed and profit. In order to ensure that this story doesn't happen again, the city of Tampa, not a CRA, needs to be the one who takes con full control of Memorial, and it needs to happen now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Eileen Henderson, 914 West Fribley Street, Tampa. Good morning, Council. First, congrats to those retaining their seat. Good luck to those whose campaigning is not yet done. And thank you to those who will be moving on to hopefully bigger and better things. Today, while my mission remains save Memorial Park Cemetery and not have CRA purchase, but the city buy it back and add it to their collection of all white cemeteries, all right. I want to address the executive branch of Tampa City government and how it specifically pertains to Memorial Park Cemetery, ending up with a heartless property flipper, unwilling to step up, do the right thing, and hand the cemetery over to Tampa, of course, only recouping his current monetary output. And if you are watching Mr. Alexis Ortega, that would be you. In the charter that outlines those executive duties, Article 4-Executive Section 4.01-Mayor, the mayor shall be responsible to the people for proper administration of affairs 
and the mayor's powers and duties shall include, number two, the negotiation of all contracts, franchises, acquisition, and disposition of property, and upon approval thereof of city council, the execution on behalf of the city of all agreements, leases, deeds, and other instruments in connection therewith. Let me highlight a couple of words included in those duties. And upon approval thereof of city council. I ask all of you that have been seated for the last two years except one, if there ever was an agenda item seeking city council's approval to move Memorial Park Cemetery to foreclosure status. I mean, they had two years to work with their legislative branch. Check the clerk's office records. The information is outlined there on how this all came to be. I mean, I am no lawyer, but I'm pretty sure it says the mayor needs city council's approval prior to moving forward with the execution of this property as outlined in those executive duties. Clearly, there is a need for more checks and balances and your constituents voted yes on three out of four charter amendments just a couple of days ago, forcing more of a check and balance system to be in place. Bravo to that. But while the words are there, where is the gatekeeper ensuring compliance, accountability, and transparency? The last four years, we've seen a reckless and irresponsible city administration operate as if they were the one and final word, as we have suffered consequences and national embarrassment. Once again, we are facing those consequences, and it has made national news with Memorial Park Cemetery. Stop the madness, save the city from its own destructiveness, save Memorial Park Cemetery, and for God's sake, take your snipe signs off Memorial Park Cemetery. Thank you. Thank you. Have to project something here. I can stay up while I'm talking. They're working on it. I am. It's all good. Good morning, Council. Thanks for having us. There we are. Great. Bob Whitmore, Executive Director of City Tree Citizens Action Group. I would like to introduce you, the council, to Ms. Brigette M. Brooks. As far as we know, Brigette is the youngest resident of Memorial Park Cemetery. She was born in 1968, and she was laid to rest in 1969. And during that short life, Brigette lived through a lot of black history. Arthur Ashe became the first African-American man to win the US Open even as people of color were being prevented from even stepping onto tennis courts throughout this country. Lyndon Johnson signed a sweeping civil rights bill into law in an attempt to end that sort of thing from happening. And one night in April, while Brigitte was being put to bed, Martin Luther King was shot and killed while standing on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Memorial Park issue isn't a land deal. It isn't something to be negotiated. It is one more mistake in the city and country's long list of mistakes made at the expense of black Americans. And it is a mistake that needs to be rectified now. I'm very happy to hear a deal is in the works. But upon purchase, we are calling on this city and this council and this mayor to put the shameful situation behind us claim Memorial Park as its own, and begin to restore it to its rightful place in the community as a place to be revered and marveled over. I can't help but look at this picture of this child's grave and wonder about her family and the grief that they felt that year. Martin Luther King had been shot. Bobby Kennedy had been shot. Boys in their community were being plucked from their homes to fight in Vietnam. The country is on fire, and now their baby dies. That's one child in a cemetery of 10,000 black bodies. But I will not ask you to save Memorial Park Cemetery for 100 years of black history. I will ask you to help us save Memorial Park Cemetery for one short year of black history. Mm. Bridget M. Brooks, black history. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, Council. Uh, my name is David Feeman. I reside at 3205 West of Bispo Street, uh, and I'm here today in support of the Tampa Theater's uh, request for CRA funding. I'm a board member and uh, former chair of our board uh, of Tampa Theater. Um, as you know, uh, Tampa Theater is fast approaching our 100-year anniversary. Um, the CRA allocation will go a long ways towards setting up the theater uh, for the next uh, 100 years, including uh, critical funding uh, to help complete our restoration and fully restore the theater going forward. Um, you're, you're aware of, of Tampa Theater's rich uh, history in our community. Uh, I think by being good stewards, uh, we can do our part to pass this crown jewel on uh, for the enjoyment of our children, grandchildren, and future generations to come. I can promise you the theater is in great hands with a dedicated, um, uh, committed, and passionate staff, leadership, and board of directors. We want to thank the uh, <coughs> city of Tampa for your support of Tampa Theater for so many years, and we appreciate your consideration of this request today. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, today's not Tampa, Florida. I want to say Uhuru. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. And we say we as African people should always be thinking about our freedom. And we should always be thinking about our reparations. We should always be thinking about our emancipation, even if it's the Abraham Lincoln Emancipation Proclamation. We should always be thinking about our 40 acres on the mule. We should be always thinking about our brothers and sisters in Africa and throughout the world that have been spread throughout the world for various reasons, mostly dealing with slavery, colonialism, imperialism, settler colonialism, venture capitalism, and all other forms of oppression that we've experienced for the last 623 years. And right here in this city, I always say, not liberally or not passionately, it's a do nothing garbage city council. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a do nothing garbage city council. The mayor run the city or somebody else run the city. And they're afraid a city council, they have been afraid to do whatsoever they do. And when it's any form of outside ideas that this city council here, it's always been pushed back. But they have a good way of tricking African people. And this is something that they put out throughout our community that hey, it might be average in the political game, but we need to find out who put this out. Because people can't come through our community like this. People can't do this and get away with it. We need to know who it is. Because I'm saying right here and right now, they're not invited in our community. Whosoever put this out in our community, I'm saying right here and right now. See, that's what they expect for African people. They expect to do us anything and get away with it. They expect for us not to be thinkers. They expect to go and get people to run against people who is Gwen Henderson? Who is that? Nobody knows. But the white people have a nice little trick for us. They went and got somebody to run against everybody. They got a man from McDonald's to run against a man from South Tampa, but the white people won't go for that. The man from McDonald's need to be worried about the lawsuit that's coming soon for all the food poisoning that have killed, caused high blood pressure, diseases, everything inside the African community. You don't need to be trying to be a surrogate or a puppet for a mayor in the city of Tampa. He's got other problems. Blaine Casper has other problems. But what I'm here to say this morning specifically is whosoever put this out in our community, we need to get to the bottom of it. This person, this Gwen Myers, need to make an apology for this. She needs to make an apology. She don't represent our community. We don't know who that is. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Noreen Copeland Miller. I live at 1911 East Chelsea Street in East Tampa. I am a CAC board member on East Tampa CRA. 
And I have to say this, and I really want to uh, commend this morning what Mr. Daniel said, and you may never hear me say this again, but it is disgraceful how they um, bastardized, for as I'm concerned, my representative. And I know that mm. Councilman Goose did not deserve that. And I agree with Mr. Daniels, whoever sent that out, it's, it's criminal. That was very distasteful, disgraceful. I hate the thing, and I know politics is dirty, and I didn't come here to talk about that, but I am very concerned and disturbed the way he was treated because he decided to run for re-election. And that, once again, our black folks in East Tampa were treated any kind of way. People are allowed to do anything, say anything, and get away with it in our black community. But I'm here today because I, when I saw an agenda about the cemetery, I was hoping to get an update because we were here in February, and now we're going on two months. But it, since it's continuous, I guess we won't get an update today. But we know the process, and they were working on it. That's been a month ago. I was looking at item seven, another item in East Tampa that's being continued, they're working on it. And as I look at the history for that item, I certainly hope that we're not gonna continue this for five or six months. Every month we come back, we're continuing talking about the cemetery. We deserve better, we want resolution. It should not be that um, difficult. I know with the budget last year when I looked, when the budget, the City of Tampa Budget Committee did their report that they had found $41 million somewhere that was not used, let's use that money not the CRA dollars. And I want you all to know when I purchased my mother plot and my grandfather bought our family plot, we bought, keyword that, with our money. We're not gonna pay double. We're not gonna do duplication at that cemetery. Plots are not free. We've already paid for it. The city of Tampa should do what's right. As our mayor hollered about resiliency, sustainability, well it's clear that's not happening in East Tampa. We got to do better by our community. East Tampa is the heart of the city of Tampa. Look at your demographics. And I thank you guys, the councilmen, for all you've done. And I need, we need your continued support. Thank you for speaking up for us. But know that we're not going to go away. And we are resilient. I'll keep bouncing back and bouncing back. Understand that we're not going away. Do right by the Memorial Park Cemetery and do it today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is David Jones, uh, 9606 North 12th Street over in East Tampa after some redistricting a couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, also echoing a lot of thoughts on saving the Memorial Park Cemetery that have already been said. Um, you know, it's important to make sure that we're respecting the dead, period. Um, as far as I understand, that is the only cemetery in Tampa that houses uh, uh, black veterans to rest. Uh, as I understand, it's one of, uh, what, three black cemeteries in Tampa? Um, and right now we're seeing uh, it on a trajectory to repeat the like atrocity that happened with the Zion Cemetery, where we did see projects go up on top of that cemetery, where we did see uh, people's uh, dead loved ones uh, disrespected um, once that developer put those uh, housing, that housing there. Um, it's like a violation to the black community. It's a violation to these families whose loved ones are there. It's a violation to the people who have already paid thousands of dollars to purchase these plots. Um, and I'm just hoping that y'all do the right thing. Uh, do the right thing, make sure that that uh, isn't bought up by those developers and regain that for the city. Um, and also like put a fence up around that. Just, yeah, that put up a fence around that. Um, yeah, thank y'all for the time. Thank you. Yes, uh, Board Member Carl. I'm sorry, I try not to say anything during public comment, but just for everybody who's watching about Memorial, um, the, the, the process for Memorial was handled by the administration and, uh, and the administration through their head of economic development and real estate, Nicole Travis, is, is working on resolving that. Um, but as she said earlier, she doesn't want to negotiate it in public, so she's, she's working uh, hard to try to resolve the issue on behalf of the city. Be this is, I know it's confusing everybody, but this is the CRA meeting. And so we put the memorial on the agenda when many of you came and spoke to us a month or two ago 
as a backup to make sure that at, with the CRA hat on and the city hat that we had uh, two different options to try to save it. So uh, the thing that we continue today was just the backup plan of if the city is not able to negotiate something, then the CRA would go in and negotiate. It happens right now that Nicole is, that is serving in both roles. So uh, today is not today's agenda item was not the bigger discussion on the on the on memorial. It was it was just the backup discussion in case the city is not able to negotiate something. Thank you. Good morning, John Wolf. 200 South Audubon. Uh, if you can believe it, I was smaller and my dad used to take me to Tampa Theater and that's why I'm here to speak on his behalf for the consideration so my nieces and nephews and their future kids and future generations can enjoy Tampa Theater. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Connie Burton. Um, nasty, filthy, disgusting in the way in which the election went down. Um, Councilman Goose, we have not always agreed, but I have respected your leadership. And for those who thought it was necessary to send out a, 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 a shameful, disgusting flyer with a black man's face that looked like you had been arrested with a small letter accused of shameful sexist and abusive behavior, shame on them. Mm. Now, the way it's told us in our community that the mere hands is all over it. Maybe a daughter-in-law, mother-in-law, and maybe even her lover. So as they accuse you, this is how our community is thinking, how this city cannot go forward with nastiness such as this. But what I come to say this morning is item number seven. In our community right now, we know the feeder for our young people has not been college, and it don't present a promising future because too many young people is in the system of correction. Hillsborough County leads the state in the number of adults sent to prison and returning from home and leads the state and the number of adults sent to prison and those returning home. 48% of the Florida uh, Department of Correction overall population is black folks. Too many young people going there. So while people talk about a beautiful um, entities and theaters coming to the community, why, fine as well, we're trying to save black bodies. The only way we believe we can do it at this point is by good opportunity. Item number seven cannot be pushed down the road. We have been talking about this for over two years. We want to see an actual opportunity where our young people can walk hand in hand. Even if there is some resistance from city staff, we say bring in a coordinator that would allow people not to be in a hybrid situation, but they can actually go to stormwater, can actually go to uh, human resources, that can actually see the possibility that if they do the right thing, they can move from point A to point B. Right. That's what we need to see. And some of you all, and I won't be back on this council, but I hope you continue to be in this community because we're gonna need your leadership and support. Mm. The next four years, the countdown of all countdowns, because one of you all is gonna emerge to be the mayor. And we need to see who's on the side of the people right now, starting today. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Keila McCaskill, resident here in Tampa. You know, as I think about all that they've said, it sends a strong message that the city of Tampa, or maybe it appears that in District 5, they're not, they don't want strong black leadership. Because when you see a leader that has truly shifted the community, provided some real outcomes, I mean some real resolves to some real situations in this district, grew, the, there's some growth happening there, some economic growth has began, and then we even became unified on some issues, which had not happened historically. Uh, in, in, at least in my existence. So it sends a message that that's not welcomed. What you have to be in order to be in District 5 is a puppet. 
You have to be a lap dog. Some people yes. call it a yeah. napkin. We're saying that's unacceptable. So going forward, we see what the message is. We understand how it is. And this leader did not choose to get muddy in that dirty campaign. That would have been my choice. But they taught me that's not the way you lead. Who you are and what you've done should be sufficient. And it was, but not for those that want District 5 to have a lap dog as a representative. So we won't stand for it going forward. I'm actually here today on the Soul Walk, standing in with Miss Delphine. I grew up in West Tampa with my mom in East Tampa with my dad. And when they did that park, it was Riverfront. That's what I call it, Riverfront yes. Park. But now it's somebody... I don't know who that is because we pretty much, we, we made up the fabric of that park. Like the residents across the street, West Tampa, Presbyterian, Presbyterian. most of that's gone now. Okay. But I was in Oakhurst and Riverfront Park has no reflection of the many years we spent over 15, 18 years of my life was at Riverfront Park. I see no reflect, no, nothing resembles that. Mm. So when it comes to this soul walk, it's so important. There's many African-American artists that's in this area that, that, that remembers this area they they were a part of it too so i just want to make sure we include some of those artists to get the story from the residents that were in the area make sure we preserve the history because that is important we didn't do julian b lane or riverfront park right so let's try to get that soul walk right where we can make sure we include the history of african americans since that's what it's supposed to be about right thank you so much thank right. you <clears throat> good morning city council daryl heitch um I want to follow up on what Ms. Connie Burton was speaking in respect to. The other, about a week ago, I had the opportunity to be with the violent crime. Tampa, Tampa PD had a violent crimes forum. And it was talking about a particular alley over in the West Tampa area that had to be closed off. And this alley had to be closed off because there was obviously some form of crime that was taking place or continues to take place in that area. And they made the decision to go forward and close that alley off. And in that conversation, we was talking about the many different things that the Tampa PD could control or what they could not control. And I, had, and I got up and I spoke and I said, the problem we have here is, yes, we do have a Tampa PD issue. We do have a, a violent crime issue. But what we have is an economic issue. Mm -hmm. Our young men and our young women and even their parents and even in some respect, Right now, we have a generation of our grandparents are now 40 years old. So if a grandparent is only making $11, $12 an hour, then how is it that they're going to be able to support their child and support that grandchild? So in that respect, as Ms. Connie Burden was just speaking about, the opportunities that you have the opportunity to present these young men and these young women, I teach youth entrepreneurship. And I know that our young people, if you give them the tools for success, they will win. Historically, if you put black men and black women, as you have seen in sports, in theater, in activities, we win. But if you never give us the opportunity to be in those spaces, we won't win. If you bring your child, as I was speaking earlier today with someone, our children don't have the opportunity to go to McDonald's and Burger King to work with their parents. But if you give them the opportunity based upon the tools that you have available to you, i.e. to go to the city offices and work, to go to legislature and work, to watch and mentor and see what's happening in the HR space, to possibly go follow this young lady around in her workspace. If you don't allow them that opportunity, then you are actually saying that alleyway, that's the graveyard. That's, you're putting people in many great because you are continuing to allow this opportunity to happen. So I ask you to really consider, to really take in consideration, take a take a inter, an internal look and ask yourself, if this is my child, where would I want my child to best serve at? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in the room for public comment? Okay, we have. Oh, of course, um, board member Goods. You know, item number seven is dear to my heart, and I talked about the mayor's youth program and the TLC program last week. and made a motion about that. Now, you know, I won't be here. Some of the items that are, are be coming back, I put forth because I know they're needed in our communities, especially in five. So I'm hoping whatever the council is that when they do come back, that they don't, these programs don't get washed under the rug, don't get watered down. 
opportunity doesn't come for everyone. It doesn't come for everybody. So I'm hoping that Ms. Travis will really, really make sure that Mr. Drumgoo, because I know they're working hard. And I applaud these two individuals who have come here and put in the work. Can you come here and just, you know, be rubbish that they came in to work? And I have to applaud them for that. And they do stand up to the administration and say, you know, I don't agree or disagree, you know. And you have to you, you have to applaud people who will do that. So I applaud them today for doing that. And I, I know that number seven, that they're right, there's some administrators and some managers who don't want this program. They don't want that. But I'm hoping that Ms. Travis will uh, will convince the administration that this is needed to move us forward. I want to thank the citizens for allowing me to serve on this board. It's been a great ride. I tried to put the hard work in, my, complete my assignment, as I say. And I believe I did that. We had a stumble along the way, but you know, people have stumbles along the way. But I didn't run. I'm a soldier. Continue to be a soldier. I just need my community to start being soldiers. I need them to start coming to the polls and not believe everything they hear and get the answers and not get bamboozled. Mm. You know, the, the, the four mailers, that cost me an election, there's no doubt, but I'm, I'm not upset about that at all because there'll be a reckoning for that one day. But I just want my people to understand when you have zero, one and two people go to a polling site in our community, it's pathetic. If we want better, we got to do better. And I, I say it loudly to my community right now. We want better, we got to do better. We can no longer complain about the disease if we don't want the cure. All right. And our cure is voting. You have a council here. We have several black females that are running in this race. I have several friends up here. But what I say to the people is this. If you don't vote, you don't get your issues resolved. And you have to make sure who you vote for has your issues, like any other community. Someone said that South Tampa and Mr. Carlson had seven, eight males put on him. South Tampa stood up for him regardless, because they knew mm. it was garbage. But my community don't know better to know. So we have to start knowing these things to know. I don't know the new, the new uh, person who's coming from a canopy, and I don't care. I hope she does a great job. I hope she'll fight the issues for the people like I did. And I wish her well. But I will tell you, elections do have consequences. So I'm hoping that my community does not suffer. I hope we do not suffer. Mm. But I'm going to fight on. I'm still going to be there fighting for my community regardless, working as hard as I can. But I just want to thank uh, the folks who thought it was not Robert to still come out and vote. And for those who didn't, I'm still grateful that I got the opportunity to serve and to make some kind of dent in my whole district of District 5, because it's completely a diverse district. But we make up 52% of that district. So I just want to say thank you, and thank you to my colleagues for having me serve with you on this board. And again, uh, I wish everyone well. And thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yes. Yeah, uh, Board Member Carlson. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say also, um, this, is the, this is the worst election season I think anybody's ever seen in the city of Tampa. This. Yeah. This, these nasty mailers and these attacks um, are not what we want for our city, and everybody involved in it should be embarrassed, and, and the community should stand up against them and make sure that we don't support them in the future. We know that when you held up the mailer just now, I thought it was the one about me, and it looked like the one about Lynn, because they were all designed by the same person. Yes. And they came from different packs, but they're all designed by the same person, and guess what else? All the messaging came from the same survey that was done in January. We know who was behind them. We're just waiting for the evidence to come out so that the public can see and shine light on it. And the public needs to push back against this because this is not Tampa. This is not who we are as a city. This is not what our city wants. And luckily, I won overwhelmingly because I had the money to be able to educate my public about, about the nastiness of the campaign and the lies that were told. But what happened to you is that hundreds of thousands of city resources <coughs> and city staff were used to slander you. Yes. And, and that really bothers me. City council has investigative authority and I wish we had the votes to do that because, because city, I would just ask city staff, do not participate in that kind of campaign. Somebody was keeping tally of our votes wow. and gave it to the, whoever came up with these mailers. Wow. They accused me of things <laughs> because I didn't support the overall budget. And 
and, uh, and, and, and I mean, the, the claims were outlandish. And we cannot, we cannot as a city move forward with this. But we, but, but I would ask city staff if if somebody asks you to do this and it is unethical and it's illegal, you cannot on city time using city resources uh, participate in a political campaign. You cannot. If somebody, whoever it is, if they ask you to do it, please tell us and we'll report them. We'll report them to the police. We'll report them to whoever. You cannot do that. You cannot use city resources against people. And what happened to? Uh, uh, council member goods the attacks the hundreds of thousands of dollars that were used by the city resource tag it was really bad that should not happen in the city of Tampa this is not what our public wants and the last thing I'll say is um, uh, council member goods it's been an honor working with you um, I, I've been proud to support many of your initiatives and uh, by May 1st the good news is that we won't be covered by sunshine and I want to talk to you as often as I can and I will commit to you that I'm going to continue to support and if my colleagues will support me and I think they will. We're gonna we're gonna um, keep the fire going, and we're gonna make sure we represent the community. Thank you. Right. Board Member Citro. Thank you very much. I, I I just need to add also. Dirty politics is dirty politics, no matter where it comes from. Negative flyers should not be allowed. You're gonna have a person sitting up at this dais that made it a personal attack on me. Sent out flyers with falsehoods and half-truths, but yet no one is reporting that. But I'm going to say this, that should not be tolerated by anyone who is voting for any race. Dirty politics is just that, dirty politics. Thank you, Madam. Um, we have uh, people online. Um, Michael Randolph, if you're available. Is, is he there? Oh, Mr. Randolph, no. you need to unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Uh, you're difficult to hear. You may work. Uh, may want to see if, about your volume. Okay. Uh, so you can hear me now. That's better. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the uh, West Tampa uh, CDC. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, um, my thing is going off, and it's not going to let me let me talk. But I did want to talk about the youth uh, organization that has started in West Tampa, the West Tampa Black Chamber of Congress that's going to represent African Americans in West Tampa. I also want to talk about the new classes for business and government and professional grant writing classes for residents in West Tampa to take a part of and the update to you on the March 24th meeting. My concern when I talk to people in the street as to why it was a low turnout, because you're not speaking to them. You're not speaking about displacement and gentrification. But you know how many people fear that they're going to be exercised out of the community and nobody is talking about that. That's their main concern. The other concern is that nobody is talking about empowerment for black communities, the unfair criminal justice systems, the low and the moderate income. If you want to get more people out, go all the way down and deal with the grassroots issue. That being said, we have one thing in common, uh, council and her sex, we both catch the city bus. If you want to know the, the, the heartbeat of the community, buy the city bus and you'll hear what people are saying related to grassroots efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is Ms. Tate online? Okay, Ms. Tate. Good morning, council members. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Um, first of all, my heart is truly heavy. Um, <clears throat> council Magoos, I'd like to personally thank you for all of your hard work in District 5. You've done so much in this district to bring all of us together. Uh, you educated us to the best of your ability. Some people just... Um, they're beyond reaching. Um, 
please stay with us. Um, the CRA needs your help. The neighborhood associations need your help. Um, please stay with us. Um, congratulations to those who won their races and um, best of luck to those that are in the runoff. Um, Team Jackson Heights is resting right now. We campaign so, so hard for so many of you out there. And we're a little bit under the weather right now. So um, when we get back up and rolling, we're ready. Um, I want to speak on issue 7, 11, and um, item number 16. I don't know how that's going to work. Um, the summer youth program. Ms. Burton, I'm 100% with you. Our children need a way out of crime, poverty, and gangs, and gang banging, and everything. We need this program up and running. I understand there's a portion of it is going to include training of our youth in some of the city um, departments. I'm looking forward to that. Can we please get this up and running to save our black children here in District 5? Um, Mr. Hyde, I have not met you, sir, but I appreciate uh, your input. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Um, the Memorial Park, I, I hear you, uh, Ms. Travis, so I'm going to respect your wishes, but I am getting phone calls about that park, and we do need to act expeditiously on the park. Um, I, th I think that's all I have to say. I, I, I want to speak on agenda item 16, but um, I'll hold off on that. Um, I just want to say it's been a pleasure. I thank each and every one of you for, um, especially you, Councilman Goose, for encouraging me to get more involved in the community. I am the chair, new re-elected chair of the CAC. Um, I want to learn more about CRAs and how they Function. Therefore, I'm going to enroll in that um, this class, that school that the CRA of Florida offers so that I can learn more and be more involved. But I want to thank you, sir, for, for looking at me and just saying, Ms. Tate, it's your turn. You're at back. Let's do this. And, and, and I appreciate you for having that, um, for having that um, in, in you to, to pull me out because I'm one of those people I do I kind of like I work from behind the scenes but I know I see now I I have to get out and help the community but I, I thank you so very much um, you all have a blessed day thank you is there anyone else in council chambers that would like to speak okay I know what we're doing this today. Uh, Robin Lockett. Congratulations, uh, Bill Carlson, uh, for the uh, re-election. Councilman Goose. That's all that's. Uh, you are a soldier. Uh, you defy odds. You have been true to uh, District 5. And I have enjoyed working with you around policy sometimes fussing with you, but around policy uh, of when I was, when, as I was working in the capacity of Florida Rising. You know, um, I've always identified you as a man's man. Anything that you've told me, you've held your word. Integrity, I admire that. And I admire somebody that keeps their word. If you can't do it, Ms. Lockett, I can't do it. But you have been a man's man, and I appreciate that. Um, I wasn't prepared to speak today, um, but in regards to the youth program, I keep hearing that it's dragging the feet. Um, you know, when our community comes up, it always appears that we're begging. 
It always appears that we're begging and the, road, the, the, the can continues to get kicked down the road. When, when an idea is, is brought, why is it an imp implemented? It keeps going down the road. The Fair Oaks project, I heard you say, hey, we don't need another uh, survey, we don't need another study. Mm -hmm. People, everybody knows what we want. Break the ground. Break the ground. So I want to see that project break the ground. Youth program, summer is coming. It should be our, I don't, I don't know what it is that it's a delay. So it'll be next, next summer? <coughs> hmm? Oh, so it's divvied out. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nothing against Mr. <laughs> So I, I just want things to, be, things to move, right? I, I just want things to move. Uh, community comes out, like I said, it always appears that we're begging. And that's, that's not a good feeling. Me sitting in the audience, that's not a good feeling. No. That we're pleading and we're begging and, 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 and pleading and begging, right? But, but when the information comes to our community, it's what you're gonna do in the future. And you have the opportunity to do it while you're on, on the dais now. And it's not being done. Councilman Goose, you're going to be fine. God's will, you're going to be fine. Bigger and better. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, then I will take a quick moment to say uh, thank you also to uh, my colleague, Councilman Goose, for all of his work in this community. Um, and, uh, you know, Miss Lockett's right. Bigger and better things. I know it. Um, and it's incumbent upon the rest of us to, um, to really take up for the community in areas where, um, where they aren't going to be represented anymore. So thank you so much for that. Um, we are, uh, I'm sorry, Board Member Maniscalco. I'm sorry, I, you know, I didn't know we were gonna have this discussion today, but I'm glad that we did, and I will say that I, I don't think I know anybody that's worked harder for their district than, than Councilman Goods. I don't think there's any council member that I've seen personally that's worked harder from him. He has dedicated himself for four years endlessly, tirelessly working for this community, so. Thank you, sir, and as it's been said, you know, you're going to go on to bigger and better things. You may come back. You don't know. You're a young, you're young. I'm younger than you, but, you know, you have a long ways to go. <laughs> but in four years, I've watched you. We may not have agreed on everything. We may not have voted the same, but you are always out there, always with the people. So thank you, sir. Okay, Ms. Travis. Oh, I'm sorry, board member <laughs> Miranda. office right next to mine sometime we walk in and out and we just look at each other eye to eye keep on walking because we know what we're thinking about and we both come back raised in a similar area I don't know about where you live at but I'm sure it was close by where the district you represent somewhere in that district and in fact my original house where I lived at was in the district and I, I joked with him once in a while. I said, I'm the only guy who got elected in District 5 that was not of color. <laughs> but that's the way it was back in the 70s. You had to live in a district, but you had to run citywide. That changed again, and, and, and thank God it did. Um, so I, I experienced, I learned a lot living at 1860 County Court. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot more than the teacher mm -hmm. of most colleges. And it's about communication. It's about looking at each other and respect for each other. You see, I learned so much that the guys that talked never bothered me. It was those that were silent that I was afraid of because you could never tell what was in their mind. When people talk to each other, you understand what they're talking about, what their needs are. When you don't speak to each other is when you have that separation and you don't know where you're at. And I think Orlando comes in there in that separation and made a lot of people together that were not united within the community. Mm -hmm. 
And that's if any honor to give it to him. That's the one that he put people together to have a voice to represent the whole district that he represented. And for that, I thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Travis. Good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here before you today, and uh, I am here to update you on Soul Walk. If I could have the um, uh, PowerPoint up, please. Presentation. Presentation. I'm sorry. Thank you. Presentation number could one. Could you up, just please. share your name and your title, please? Uh, Robin you. Nye, Manager Arts and Cultural Affairs for the City of Tampa. Thank you. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, on February 22nd, um, Mayor Castor launched Soul Walk. That is a project that we've been working on. We've updated you on a couple of times over the past two years. It's taken us uh, two years just to get to that point. And it's um, hopefully it, it, we've got a ways to go, but it's all really, really good stuff. The whole concept of Soul Walk is to really recognize and connect the dots of, of much of what is out in our public realm and to celebrate and recognize um, the African American culture and communities and is focusing on a lot of the lost neighborhoods that we um, are looking at. I'm, so anyway, um, the, the, it's an art and heritage trail that is um, incredibly uh, deep and rich. There's over 100 data points on the map. There are about 30 to 40 existing artworks on there, about 15 or so uh, historic markers, and then there are the historically designated sites. That is just really what the existing area is. That's what this launch achieved, is connecting the dots about what's out there and what's existing. Let's recognize what what's, has been invested in, in it within the community and, and let's make those connection points. The next phase of it is the really exciting phase that we are going to be digging into and focusing on. As you can see, see here with the foundation um, that we have been working on the past couple of years, we examine the feasibility of urban trails. Like, let's make this right. What kind of an urban trail will work in Tampa? What is successful? How can we engage it? How can we make it something that um, people want to participate in and, and engage in? And how can we really recognize the rich, diverse cultural life within our neighborhoods? And this is our road or our path to do that. So. Um, we assembled a team, our internal team includes a group of incredible, wonderful scholars that we are very, very blessed to be able to work with. USF Institute of Black Life, we're also working with University of Tampa. Uh, HCC, Tampa Bay History Center is um, very much our partner on this. So it is something that is um, pulling together for it to be sound, solid, and something that will be sustainable and Everybody hopefully will be proud of it and we can move forward together. Over the next two years, the trail will continue. Now, now it's time to just kind of, we, we, we need input, we need information, we need to connect the dots. The beauty of this, what I really love about it, I'm so, so happy that there were these comments in, in the uh, um, audience today because it's for them. It, the, the whole essence is, it's not my story, it's their story it needs to be something that is wonderful. Um, the model that we looked at was um, Washington, D.C.'s African American Heritage Trail. That trail is so smartly designed, it is connected, it took a long time for them to do it, and if you look at that trail, that trail, because it was so well done and how it's connected and you've got the scholarship, you bring up the history, let's bring those connections in, they get a ton of money for preservation. If people want to be on the trail, they want to be on the Soul Walk. So, I mean, excuse me, on the African American Heritage Trail of, of Washington, D.C. Our, our name's just a little shorter. So it is, um, 
an avenue, it's an opportunity to just kind of connect the dots and pull together and make something that is really honestly for everyone. Um, and over the next uh, couple of years, we'll be looking at, I, I actually, I recounted that, and so there's not approximately 14 new historic markers. There's probably going to be more like 30, I think, that we'll be looking at, and again, working with our um, partners and um, historians to make sure that everything's connected, and fresh scholarship. One thing I found out this morning, as a matter of fact, is that one of our scholars at USF is going to be incorporating Soul Walk into their curriculum. And that's great, because if we can get those students working on it, then, that, then we all win, because they'll just plug it in and, and help us with that knowledge and, and connect within, within the community. Um, we have always, there are some things underway. The problem with, I don't want to say problem, but it's like it's a negative, but a characterization of this is that it does take a long time, and it is slow, and it may look like nothing's happening, and I certainly recognize that frustration. Um, we do have two artworks that are underway. We have a temporary memorial. Uh, the artist is uh, for, for Zion Cemetery, excuse me, in partnership with the Tampa Housing Authority. Um, that artist is working. We should have some concepts, I think, by the end of March, I think. I think. Um, and then we also have artist Aneka Jones, who is a rising star, uh, working on us for a project at Hannah Avenue that is a wonderful, this is a, a kind of a different example also in terms of how we are engaging and connecting with the neighborhood because Aneka is going to be working with um, seniors from all of our community centers. Parks and Recreation is a huge partner with us. They're going to be, representatives of our seniors are going to be working with Aneka, um, making like a sewing circle. They're going to be embroidering an artwork that's going to be part of the city's collection right in, in Hannah. So there's some wonderful, wonderful things that are happening. It's just below the radar. And I'm, that's just, I'm sorry, the nature of the beast, I guess. It, um, these projects take a long time. A, a glimpse, I, am, I apologize to the people in the back. I'm sure that's hard to read. But um, there is a lot that is still to come. The engagement is important. It is it's the only way it's going to be accepted and used if it's a uh, public-private partnership and if people like it and want it and enjoy it. So it's, it's got to, you know, have input. It's got to have everybody connect to it. The nice thing about it also is that through, it, 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 it's all about cultural. Foundationally, it is absolutely connected to culture um, through discussions and just awareness and sometimes um, soft brushing and bumping up against each other, you learn about each other and you learn about other cultures. And that leads really to some good conversations and understanding. And I also want to stress that our artists are really, really good. And our artists get some of those tough conversations started. And that's where you can make progress, especially in a community or in a neighborhood that's got a lot of things that they want to talk through. Um, and we also are, we've got some, uh, I want to mention real quick, and I, I, uh, I think I probably have gone on longer than I should have, but it's just such a good project. We have some wonderful people that are working with us. I must stress the kindness and the, how people are sharing their knowledge and information, research, scholarship. It's just very, very positive. Uh, we'll also be working on a, um, a food blog so that we can have recipes and just, it's just a way to connect and engage. It's a different way of doing um, kind of cultural engagement, and I think, honestly, a lot more cities should be doing what we're doing, if I may be so blunt. With that, thank you. Okay. Um, Board Member Maniscalco. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. You know, I think you, you, a wonderful presentation. If you look at Tampa in general, we talk about, everybody knows Ybor City and the Italian history, and the Spanish, and the Cubans, and on and on and on. And we've emphasized that for so long. Ybor City, even after urban renewal, we came in and we, people before us, and, and created this National Historic Landmark District. And at the same time, on the outskirts, on the outskirts of downtown, you have what was Central Avenue and the Scrub, which is mentioned in this book here. <coughs> you have the history in West Tampa on Main Street. People like Moses White, who came from, from Central Avenue to here, people like Mr. Doby, Dobyville, a discussion we had most recently. Um, but we've never emphasized it. You know, most, more recently, we, uh, we took the name of the Laurel Street Bridge and, and put back Fortune, the Fortune, Madam Fortune Taylor Bridge, a woman who was enslaved at one point and now was 
a very large landowner and highly respected individual here in Tampa. And, uh, but a lot of people don't know that. Everybody knows Ebor. People come to Tampa and they go, Ebor City, Ebor City. You hear it all the time, but what about this? And with the renaissance that we're going through in many parts of the city, but not all, um, all the people that are moving here, I was looking at the, the residents in downtown. We didn't have that type of residential not so long ago. And now you have people that live, work, play here. This is their community. And just right around here where they can walk to, there's so much to learn. You know, we've torn down so much. <coughs> However, what we still have, we need to protect, preserve, and emphasize. So when people come to Tampa, they don't say, oh, the Riverwalk is great. Oh, I love going to Armature. Oh, they need to know what used to be. And we need to teach that. And that's what's very, very important. I enjoy serving with you on the Arts Committee. Um, and this is, of course, something that has come up. This is a huge undertaking, but we have to advertise this mm -hmm. so that everybody knows. Again, everybody comes down for all these wonderful things I've mentioned, but when you have this, you're educating a new generation or even Tampa natives that just never knew. Yeah. So again, thank you very much for that presentation. This is uh, wonderful. Um, and, I, and I appreciate all your efforts. So. Thank, you, thank, thank you. you. I should mention real quick, I'm so sorry that I forgot to mention this, but there is an app, uh, it's either uh, Bloomberg Connects, there's, a, uh, there's an app in which the information that's on the, the guidebook is on the app as well. Um, we only had like 20 or 30 guidebooks printed because it was a test to see how they looked. So we'll be working on printing more of those. We need, uh, hopefully if there's a printing, somebody who wants to sponsor printing will um, <laughs> entertain that right now. Uh, board Member Vier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And good remarks by Councilman uh, Maniscalco on this. And, and, and Robin, like I said before, you, you, this, we've talked about this a lot, and it really comes from your heart. I mean, you, you really, really believe in uh, this mission. You're very sincere and very passionate about it, so I just wanted to salute you for that. I mean that. I, I, I saw this. This is uh, Tim Heberlein, uh, Councilman Citro's uh, legislative assistance copy. May we have one uh, for each council member, if yes, we may, because I keep so on borrowing sorry. Tim's. I, so, my apologies, I left them on no, my table in my you're fine. office. God bless you, you're fine. Um, but, but this is something that's really, really important. You know why I, uh, you, you go through parts of Florida and you read about things that happen in Florida and you have to find them because we don't tell people about them. I, I always point people to uh, a Floridian that everybody should know and a lot of people do know, but not enough, Claude Neal. Uh, in Mariana, 1934, Jackson County, the, the last spectacle lynching in the United States, stuff that I can't even uh, uh, talk about in public, so to speak. Um, but if you go to Mariana by the Jackson County Courthouse, they have the tree where uh, Mr. Neal's burned, scarred, torn up body was put up, um, and there's no marker there. But you go about 20 feet and there's a Confederate memorial that talks about the lost cause of the Confederacy. But it's a public memorial on public land and there's no acknowledgement of that. Um, Willie Howard in Live Oak, Florida, you could go on and on and on. Um, th this, this is something great for Tampa because it talks a lot about a lot of our history, uh, et cetera. You know, I, I, one of the things that we can talk about this as well is I'd love to see more um, uh, acknowledgements, and I see the, the, the lynching markers here and different things like that, but of the Jim Crow era violence and whatnot. I mean, I know uh, the Portico recently did a trip to um, Montgomery, Alabama uh, to, for the soil collection for Lewis Jackson, who was lynched uh, in 1903 near Ybor City uh, and whatnot. Different thing, like what, what, what the term Houstonized meant in Tampa years ago, et cetera. Um, but this is, this is just really, really wonderful. I mean, just looking, and, and again, I, I, I really urge the public to get their hands on, on this book. This is this is just really, really good stuff. It's very encouraging um, and just really, it's positive in the sense that it, it moves us forward. But again, it's something that really, really comes from your heart. We've talked about it. It's part of your heart, part of your soul, and, and, and you're just really engaged in good public service on this. So thank you. Thank you. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, um, yeah a, few, a few things connected to this. Thanks, thank you, Robin, for all the hard work you do and everything. Um, uh, it, it just public service along the same line. Stageworks has a play starting next week. I think it was Mark Lab, Lab uh, wrote it about the, um, the sit-ins in Tampa and um, uh, in the lobby of stage, and so everybody should go see that to learn about uh, that part of the history of Tampa. Uh, but also Lenny Foster, who's a friend of mine from St. Augustine, is gonna, has an exhibition that he's just installed there in the lobby. He, 
he went through St. Augustine and took pictures of shoes in front of the places that the civil rights demonstrations happened, especially Martin Luther King. And then he and I mapped out the places in all of Florida where Martin Luther King visited. And he came over already and took pictures of um, the, the um, armory building with shoes in front of it representing Martin Luther King there, and then also Jackson House. And so those photos will be there. So please, everybody, support um, Stageworks and Lenny's photos. He's eventually going to do a whole tour of Martin Luther King sites in Florida. Um, Second, um, Anika, the, the, the artist you saw, I saw her at um, Gasparill Arts Festival the other day, and she's a, just a phenomenal artist, and we need to do everything we can to keep her in this community. So please let us know if we can do anything to uh, support her, and thank you for getting her involved. I mean, she's had cover of Time Magazine, which you showed there, and um, unfortunately her art is a lot more expensive than it was a couple years ago, so it's harder for us individually to collect, but she's a, she's a rising national, international star, and she's only in her early 20s. Um, next, um, you mentioned Bloomberg, um, although I appreciate the donation that Bloomberg has given to our city. There is great concern in our community about Bloomberg being involved and embedded, uh, primarily because people want more than one philosophy and more than one school of thought. Um, I have great concern about using Bloomberg technology. Um, if our content is embedded in their sites and their apps, I have great concern about that. I would rather, if you need uh, budget for apps or website or some other materials, please come before us or city council and ask us for it. I don't think we should be putting anything on, nice, on Bloomberg nice technology. To, to that? Um, and ju just the last thing real fast um, connected to that is that uh, also, um, you know, we had someone talk about, about public input before. Also, if you need a budget to hire people to get public input related to this or other projects, please let us know that too. I know the city has very tight budgets around all this stuff and we all need to look about uh, look carefully with money, but um, when we're protecting the cultural history and assets uh, uh, of our community, especially parts of our community that have been underrepresented, we need to make sure that we do it carefully and that we get buy-in from everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Maniscalco. Just to follow up, um, you know, when I, when I want people to, when they think about Tampa, I want them not to think about, you know, Cuban sandwich or Tom Brady or whatever, but that we are a uh, cultural and historical destination. Council member Carlson brought up St. Augustine. St. Augustine being the oldest and St. Augustine and St. Augustine. But Tampa has so much to offer and it's more than just the University of Tampa, which is uh, a building that is in the top 10 best Victorian or most important Victorian structures in the country, or again, 7th Avenue in Ybor City, or MacDill Air Force Base, or whatever. There's so much to talk about going back to the beginning, before it, when it was Tampa Town, Tampa Township, whatever it was called before the 1887 uh, organization of, of what we have today. Uh, I want people to recognize Tampa as a place that when they visit, it's not just where they go to a restaurant that may be well known, that they visit our museums, that they go to the History Center, that they pick up this book or use it digitally via the app and walk the walk and walk those footsteps, even if it's a place where uh, the building was torn down or as Councilmember Vieira was, where, where, where a murder took place. Whatever it is, we need to talk about it and we need to share it with everybody. I mean, it could be very simple. At Curtis Sixon, there's a marker for Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, because he played, I think, two concerts here in the 60s. But we emphasize that. There's a natural historic marker that costs money. But there's so much to talk about. Yesterday I spoke to a group, a leadership group, and I just tried to talk about history. And I said, uh, you know, I apologize. I talk a lot and I go on a lot of tangents. But, uh, and I talked and talked, whatever, you know, within the hour. And one person in the front said, I can listen to you talk all day. Which tells me that people care and, and people are interested in this history. My last question is, uh, do you have more of these so I can pass them out? I only have like 10 or 12 more copies left. We only got 100 printed because, it, and most of them are gone. We need a printer, a sponsor, if anybody's interested, I'll repeat that. Yeah, but something like <laughs> this, and, and maybe we'll, you know, yeah. we'll help with that. That would be, a budgetary we would thing, love it's to. It's no big deal. Yeah, we have over I, I, 100,000 um, African American uh, guests coming to Tampa this summer, which is absolutely wonderful. So we want this to be available to them as well. These are a, a, a number of conventions that are coming, so it would be just absolutely terrific to make but them feel I welcome. This, I want this place everywhere all over the city. So when people, they could be having 
lunch in West Tampa and they go, well, I don't know what to, uh, you know, I have nothing to do this weekend or, or it's boring or whatever, they can pick this up and explore Tampa and open their mind to history that they may not have known, places that they've driven by forever and ever, not realizing, hey, yeah. so uh, whatever you need and support to let everybody know about this, please let, it, let me know and I'm sure this council will be supportive because, uh, again, we have to spread the message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Citro. Thank you very much, Ms. Knott. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be at the, uh, the opening of it the other day. And while I was there, I did take a stroll through part of it. And I found out some interesting things, which I'm not going to discuss here because I want people to go find out on their own. And I cannot wait to take the rest of the tour of that. Uh, are you working with Ike, the um, kiosks down here? So that way people will know about it when they're walking around trying to find out things to do. Yes, sir. There are ads on Ike. Excellent. Ike Thank you. You were also going to make a comment, but you were uh, about uh, Bloomberg. I just wanted to mention that it's Thank also you. on the, you, there's sure. an app on the city's website as well. Um, board, board member Vier. And, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. Um, and a couple of things that, you know, I'm glad Councilman Carlson mentioned that on funding because that's why I originally motioned for this was to see if there were any supplemental ideas that the CRA maybe wants to um, uh, get into this to supplement this is that we can, you know, help, help out on that. Um, and, ob and maybe printing more is, is one of them, who knows, right? Uh, another thing I also wanted to mention that we're working on here, uh, uh, hopefully in the CRA, that I see here is Marti Maceo, uh, the, the, the Afro-Cuban history. I mean, you talk about a, a social club born out of racial discrimination and racism and terrible injustice, right. and now one that, that, in my opinion, continues to be at risk um, and that really, really ser deserves support on, on <coughs> many, many, many different scales. Um, so yeah, just uh, something that's very, very important. But yeah, but again, uh, just wanted to add that uh, in terms of funding. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to say thank you as well for this um, uh, obviously amazing book, amazing presentation, what you're doing to put everything together. Um, I know that I believe it's Florida Stories through the Florida History um, has a great uh, web um, great app that you can like listen to walking tours they have one of ebor they have one of other places all over the mm -hmm. state and maybe maybe being able to partner with them to do something would be wonderful uh, and then the only other thing i want to mention because we did have people come up and talk about the fact that they have not had a chance to share their history um, and i see that the engagement and outreach only has one um, uh, like call to action or serve and we have some surveys that haven't been done yet but I would love to know how we could um, uh, engage the community more for their stories um, in addition to the stories that we're finding yeah. that would just be my only request so yes may I uh, good morning again, Council. Um, the arts is extremely important to economic and redevelopment, and <clears throat> we brought before us conversations about the arts. When you talk about expanding the engagement and you talk about funding opportunities, um, I just, I couldn't sit on the sideline and just say as we're going into our budget season, Robin is a department of one, and so when you talk about the engagement that's needed that we would like to, I'm gonna put a plug in here for you to double down on your redevelopment and economic investments and in possibly investing in the arts and possibly funding a position um, to help us not just with this particular project, but all of the arts projects that we want to start pulling together. Um, the program that um, <clears throat> Councilman Maniscalco, I think was holding up and asking for additional copies, the CRA can fund additional copies of that. Um, the platform that Councilman Carlson was talking about, if we need to do that, there's things that the CRA can partner to do, but I thought it would be mm -hmm. robbery if I didn't take this opportunity to put a plug in that um, the arts is underfunded. And if there's an opportunity for us to, um, to do that across all districts with your new model that you approve, I would, I would love to do that for you. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Board Member Carlson. If I could just add to what you said, um, you mentioned uh, Florida Stories, I think, mm -hmm. right? So I used to be on the board of the Humanities, Florida Humanities, oh, now they call okay. it Humanities mm -hmm. Council. And um, 
one of the uh, one of the stories you can find on Florida stories is called the Jose Mar Jose Marti Trail, <laughs> and it's one I created with Gary Mormino um, and uh, Chaz Mena, who's a um, Jose Marti scholar. But the idea was, if you go to a place, uh, you you remember it by the stories that are told. And right. and Tampa has really rich, important history uh, with uh, with Jose Marti. And uh, it's, it's the reason why my other office is in Ybor and in and a, and a location where he gave two of his most famous speeches. Um, but that, uh, putting together one of those Florida stories is not very much money. I can talk to you guys about it offline. But the good thing about it is that they have a huge audience. Thousands of people have downloaded that one and mm -hmm. taken a tour of, of Ybor listening to that. Um, and, uh, and so they have their own platform that they promote, but it's also on an internationally known platform where people can find it when they get to Tampa. <laughs> Um, so it's it's a great way to promote. Another thing is um, through the Arts Alliance, uh, we're partnering with um, Visit Tampa Bay, and we've created now I think six videos. Robin participated in it, but we're, we've created six videos about the arts in Tampa, and they're really amazing, dynamic, and they're promoting them heavily. But we need to make sure that we uh, that they're they're targeting you know the Black History segment. So that the point is there are some resources that we can sure. partner. And to your last point about staff, um, I think we should hire Robin and let the city. Um, uh, use her salary to hire a second person um, because because we could really do some dynamic things with the arts. If, Carlson, I still have to go back across the street. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the, all the everybody everybody is still employed with the city. Uh, yeah. We're just we're just um, working with them. But I think there's through the CRAs there's some really amazing things we could do with the arts. And so if we can't if we can't have um, Ro Robin dedicated to us, then maybe we could have the second person. But um, we know that the arts are, um, uh, you know, as we did in St. Peter, they're, they're completely connected to innovation and technology and, and the, the growth of uh, the high value companies. So uh, look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. If you would like, um, we would like to put forth a position to do that that would work directly with Robin, that would work in the CRAs and work strictly. If it's a position fully funded by the CRAs, it will be limited to um, just the CRA. So if that's the consensus going into our budget process, we, we, need, we need to know that so that we can incorporate that ask um, for 24, fiscal year 24. I think we need to look at it in the context of all the other budget because we, sure. for a while it seemed like we were getting staff heavy. But um, I, I so strongly believe that the arts are uh, an economic engine, not only for, um, uh, for real estate development, but also you know, for connectivity and culture. But we know, I, I probably said this before, but I, I've interviewed a lot of CIOs of, of tech companies, and they say their best programmers study music. And, um, and so we know that the arts are completely interconnected with um, innovation and, and technology. And the only way our tech sector is going to grow is if we, ha if we um, engage the arts in a much higher way. Thank you. I feel, would, would you allow me to, would you like me to bring it back to you just so you could see where it falls um, or not to investigate? I don't want to go down that road if it's not something you want me to investigate. Um, I would like to make a motion to just ask um, staff to bring back a proposal for an arts person as part of the staffing budget proposal. Second. Second. When do we bring it back? Next month? I can. I can bring it back in April when we do the... Um, for, services agreement for whatever the april um 13th. april 13th april 13th thank you okay i have a motion made by a board member carlson seconded by board member member maniscalco all in favor Aye. Aye. any opposed motion carries thank you You want to ask a question? Yes. Come, come on up. Don't worry about it. I am not pleased about how this is going. Um, 98 hot because this is not representative of the community. It's disrespectful. Thank you very much. Mr. Travis, Yes, sir. I feel that I know where she's coming from. So let's make sure if we're talking about putting this type of person on our budget, and that's the CRA over there, that's Tampa, and throughout, let's make sure we get with them and make sure what they want with it so their voices are heard. I know the city's doing their thing, but in different communities, they have the people who they feel are our leaders. And that's a problem sometimes. People believe uh, 
the black folks, uh, other cultures believe they know who our leaders are. Thank you. And you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And everybody's not our leader. I so, understand. So let's just make sure they know who truly, who have been our workhorses in our community. Not some people who, some people have put them and say, well, they, such and such is a high prolific person. No, but this person here was the one down at the bottom down here who was really doing the work. So I think let's make sure we work with the people and understand. When we talk about putting portraits out of people or things like that, let's look and see who, who are who they believe their leaders are in their communities. Absolutely. We're, I gave myself in my card and um, administrator wins contact information. We're definitely going to follow up and follow through on it. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, just introducing the next item on the agenda. So it, it is uh, an update on Tampa Union Station, and uh, Brandy Miklas is here to provide an update on, uh, on the progress on that particular project, and I'll just ask that uh, slide number three, or excuse me, presentation number three be brought up, and it's just a single slide, but she'll provide that, uh, that update for you. Thank you very much. And before you begin, ma'am, um, I attended the... Uh, Urban League of Hillsborough County's gala Saturday at the uh, train station and it was so beautifully decorated and set up that if you did go great if you saw it um, it really made our city proud a great group of community leaders all sorts of folks but how special that place is and and then I I realize again how underutilized it is you know it's a very important historic structure um, so I just wanted to make that known Go ahead. Thank you. Well, good morning, CRA board members. My name is Brandy Miklas. I serve as a volunteer board member and president of Friends of Tampa Union Station. And I'm here to give you an update on the restoration project that will soon be underway at Tampa Union Station. Um, let's see. The presentation First. is up if you'd like okay, to. Okay, perfect. Ready. Oh, and before I go into that, um, I was um, suggested to bring an award that um, Friends of Tampa Union Station received last month from the Downtown Partnership. It was during their annual Urban Excellence <coughs> Awards. And the war award um, is the Downtown Collaboration Award. So it's right here. Um, it's pretty heavy, beautiful. Um, scratched me a couple times that evening, actually. <laughs> but um, The Downtown Collaboration Award recognizes a group partnership that provides a unique and positive um, contribution to downtown. And this group partnership, this unique um, positive contribution would not have been possible without the support of CRA staff, um, facility staff, historic preservation staff, and, um, and of course the CRA board. Um, City administration, Mary Jane Castor, she was there for our ribbon cutting for the um, the baggage building renovation back in November. And we did not, would not have been able to do that. It was a big volunteer effort um, without um, getting the Hillsborough County's Historic Preservation Grant Award um, for 95,000. And then we had um, uh, private donations that basically collect collectively got to about 200,000 to do this. So um, thank you so much. Um, Board Member Maniscalco for mentioning the um, Hillsborough County Urban League um, party, though, for, at the main station. Um, I'm sorry, it wasn't a party. It was their annual gala. Um, we're, we always love any sort of activation that occurs at Union Station. And the baggage building was built also in 1912, and um, it did not have fire protection. It did not have air conditioning. And it needed a lot of work when the windows and so it's an additional space 3200 square feet um, to add to the whole um, Tampa Union Station um, property so um, next was there a second slide okay perfect um, so that recognizes the um, the award and then oh I love I'm like and will it fast forward on its own so sorry about that at least um, so briefly, our overall update, you see um, team members for um, the design build restoration that is underway at Tampa Union Station. The kickoff meeting is scheduled for next Friday, March 17th, with um, collage companies and the city. So that will be our official start. And um, we have a few um, um, staff in the audience if you have any questions. 
don't think we have any questions, but thank you. Oh, um, so. um, board member Carlson. No, did you have, you have more slides, or is that the end of the presentation? That is the, that's the last slide. Oh, okay. Um, could you just tell us? Uh, so you talked about the the baggage area, which was funded by the county, right? So the the work that that the CRA is funding. When does that start, and when does it end? Well, the, since the kickoff meeting is next Friday, March 17th, we'll be finalizing the schedule and dates, and we'll have more information after the kickoff meeting. My understanding is that it'll be done um, um, within a 12-month period. And you all still, I know the prices were going up before, we, and we increased our commitment um, during the process of talking to you all. And um, is, do, you, do you have enough money now to continue to do whatever you need to do? No, that's good. Um, in addition to the money that was um, committed by this board, the CRA board, um, Friends of Tampa Union Station has been working closely with the city's grant um, manager and grant department to also get additional funding. Um, last November, we were, um, we were notified, the city um, grants team was notified that we received $400,000 from the historic um, state preservation grant. And um, we were actually ranked number two. So out of over 30 um, applicants, so that's fantastic. And we are also working with the um, city's grants team for a 1.5 million um, grant through the Federal Railway Administration. So when we were talking about the budget, it, we got slowed down a little bit because you are were saying that, or the city was saying that, um, that, that they were gonna go for grants, and so why should we fund all of this? And what we said is that we'll, we'll preload it so you all can move fast, and then, um, and then if you get grants, the CRA would be reimbursed. So do you think when, the, when these grants come in, will it be on top of the budget that we allocated, so you'll have more money to do things, or is it, will it be a reimbursement to the CRA for the current? So the CRA's initial investment in Union Station is experiencing with these other grant opportunities a significant multiplier. So the, the significance of that is the, it allows for additional restoration um, or additional restoration work and upgrades to take place without further commitment from CRA dollars. So no refund, but we, we won't have to be, we won't have to top it up, okay. Um, and, then, um, and then the other thing is uh, parallel to this, also we talked about um, a World War II monument, I think Robin's dealing with that. But the other thing was um, putting a coffee shop and co-work space in there. So what's the status of that and, and the RFPs that might go out for that? And mm -hmm. uh, there was going to be a redesign of the ticketing area to open up the back room and the upstairs. Is all that underway? Well, when we were, um, the team was meeting, it, um, the goal is to have this space activated as soon as possible after the restoration. So the request for proposals can actually take place um, not, not as soon as the restoration is done, but before, so that way they're timed in parallel, um, par parallel streams. And two other things. Um, since this is a CRA, it's a city-owned property, but it's a CRA initiative, I would just ask that whoever is CRA um, chair at the time be stand with you or whoever is the president of Friends of the Tampa Union Station. It's, it's, we want to make sure the public knows that it is a CRA project and that their money is being spent wisely. And I think as much as people are excited about the, the restoration of this important building, they're more excited about the idea of the incubator space, the business incubator space. And so as we, as we have incremental announcements to the media, please make sure that the chair of the CRA is front and center. And also, uh, lastly, I want to thank, I want to thank you and your board um, and especially Jackson McQuig, who has been around a long time. Um, he, um, he and his dad were pioneers in saving this, this uh, facility, and he was a great advisor on, to all of us on, on, on fixing this. He's probably watching right now uh, from Atlanta. And, um, and also, um, thank you to all the staff members, Dennis and others who have been involved in this. And um, finally, thank you to the chief of staff. We were kind of bogged down with this, and chief of staff organized a meeting where there were like 10 or 12 staff people and suddenly everything moved forward quickly. So thank you to him for helping to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Oh, I apologize. One last thing. 
this year is the 25th anniversary of the, rest, the original restoration of the station that occurred in 1998. And we have not held a Tampa train day since pre-COVID. And so we are on for a Tampa train day event. It is always, it recognizes the, the birthday of the station, which is um, on May 15th, 1912. So we usually recognize it on the second Saturday in May. And this year it falls on Saturday, May 13th more information to come, but it'll be recognizing the 25th um, anniversary of the station reopening. Thank you, of course. Uh, just one more quick question. There was a, the expressway authority had, um, had in their proposal to take away the land in front. And then also there was an idea somewhere in the city to put the Greyhound station there with, and either one of those could destroy this whole project. So I think those are dead, am, am I right? <coughs> or, or are they still floating um, around? Thea, the Tampa Hillsboro Expressway Authority, they did have a, um, a PD&E study. Um, basically, it was just, um, it was a Nebraska PD&E study. They have determined they're going to go with the no-build alternative, so they will not be pursuing any of the, um, the land in front of the station, because the station's nestled between Twigs, Nebraska, and Nuccio Parkway, so... Um, but no, that they're yeah, going just, to no build. Just because since we can't talk outside of Sunshine, just to my colleagues, if it, um, you know, I talked to the head of Expressway Authority and some of the board members, but just to make sure we can't allow um, that land to be taken just because it's not used doesn't mean we can put a big uh, ramp right in front of this important historic building because it's going to be the center of all the activity with what um, uh, Gasworks is doing and, uh, and Encore and uh, Channel District and all those things happening there. Um, and then the other thing is the bus station, that would just be a disaster um, uh, because it's not synergistic at all with, um, if, it, if it was a local bus route heart uh, station, that might make sense, but it makes more sense to have them go to Marion Street or something like that instead of coming out of the train station. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Chair. Board Member Citro. Ms. Nicholas, hold, hold up that award again. All right, here we go. I congratulate you and everyone involved when you were presented that I was there and uh, it just made me proud of all the work that you do. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Councilman. Thank you. Okay. Hello again. Um, slide to number four please item for item number four this is the CRA director's monthly report <clears throat> in at this meeting you requested there was a request for us to look at several items that have significant costs associated with it and um, what I'm going to do is talk to you both about the urban circulator for what board member Citro made a motion for us to investigate then I'm going to show you um, your budget as it relates to that item and if you were to consider a request for Tampa theater what that would look like um, I'm as you can tell we have a packed agenda and sometimes we don't get to talk through policy issues and how you want to fund um, certain initiatives and um, or cultural institutions and so I look forward to your June retreat where we could start talking about that and setting some policy um, parameters and allowing you to look at the budget at a 10-year window so you can see what you can and can't fund so um, slide show thank you so the first item we're going to talk about is the urban circulator which is item number five councilman Citro uh, made a motion for staff to look at um, funding 16 million dollars towards the premium transit urban circulator that will run in dedicated lanes between Fort Brook Garage and Tampa Heights um, in this right now, HDR is currently doing an analysis. We don't know what the ultimate funding requests will be or how to break out the funding over time, but I wanted to show you um, what this would look like, what your budget looks like for the downtown CRA. And so this is just a, con a col we have a lot of, uh, thank you for bringing that up. We have a lot of, um, rows in the budget and we've collapsed it just so you can see um, where I've plugged in numbers you have things for the Museum of Art the Stras um, that's plugged in and it shows you at the bottom line how much money you have 
if you were to make some of these um, commitments. You have the capacity, as you go out to the outer years in um, fiscal year 27 and 20, or fiscal year 28 and beyond, some of the funding commitments that you've made start to free up. There's other projects that are in the work. There are other capital projects. So I don't want you to think that in 2028, we have a windfall of money. You have projects that are have not been funded yet, but are in this collapse, but hidden cells in this collapse budget. So should you wanted to want to move forward with the urban transit circulator, you could plug an item in in these outer years. You can afford to do it, not in this fiscal year, um, but you can afford to do that. I plugged in for just purposes of this conversation, if you were to fund Tampa Theater, what those numbers would look like. Um, so just talking through the cell um, or the spreadsheet, the beginning balance is the number that you have carry forward. This is unallocated um, surplus or carry forward money. You start off with $22 million. Your increment for the downtown CRA is about $23 million. Your interest is there and it shows that you have in fiscal year 23, $45 million to work with. There's several commitments in this year, but the one line item that I want you to, um, to be aware of is the infrastructure improvements other than building. Um, I should have changed this. It's, that number is $8 million. What I'm showing is an, uh, you move money for a Tampa theater, but it leaves you with $637,000 in this current fiscal year. So, we need to talk about the urban circulator if you would like to do it. I don't know what that funding request looks like. I don't know how much over time, but I'm showing you that you can start plugging away a million dollars and probably increase that number as you get more availability in your budget in the future. So I'm happy to have the conversation with you. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, I just want to say first for the public watching, um, unfortunately, this is CRA money, which is trapped in this district in downtown. Um, the biggest complaints I hear in South Tampa, why can't we fill potholes? Um, why can't we uh, fix our parks? Uh, why can't we have sidewalks? Why can't we have more police and fire? And unfortunately, um, there's, uh, we cannot create a CRA in South Tampa, so we can't um, capture money down there. I tried a couple years ago to move this money out and failed. Uh, so having failed that, uh, the, uh, and there's no slum and blight in downtown anymore, although the, the, the CRA continues. Um, so in, in the absence of having slum and blight, um, what we've tried to do is invest in projects that benefit the whole city. So these are economic engines, but they're also assets that the whole city can attend to. So Tampa Theater, for example, is a historic building, but it's also you know, one of the literal icons of our community and it is um, uh, a beloved place that everybody can attend. I know some people felt like they couldn't attend the Strath Center. Um, our investment of 25% of a $100 million project in a city building where they're spending 75 million, that was a great investment, I think, and, and they're opening a lot of it up to the public, so it will be more accessible. But the Tampa Theater um, <clears throat> is, a, is a great opportunity to support uh, an, an important um, project and asset, and I mentioned this before, but for anybody watching for the first time, Tampa Theater in the 80s, I think John probably will say, um, you know, had dust all over the, the um, plaster figures and, and they lit, somebody literally sh like sprayed water all over it to fix it. And if you went to see the restoration of the lobby, there's, there are experts all over the country that just specialize in these theaters. We happen to have one here who's a painter and they match the pigment and everything. You have to meticulously go through it. Um, there have been political threats to Tampa Theater, uh, which I won't go into, um, that, that set them back on, um, on trying to invest in their future. There also was an underlying lease issue that slowed us down. This was a proposal we brought it for, for two years ago, um, and they had to deal with the underlying lease issue, so um, that now has been resolved. Uh, that was a city issue. This is a CRA issue. They're two totally different uh, groups, but uh, what what this would do along with the other arts projects is um, is really help energize our arts community which is a huge economic engine not just for the restaurants and bars around but also uh, for our technology community that's intertwined with arts and so um, i appreciate everyone's support on on the um on the tampa theater i'll leave it up to my colleague um board member um, well, Arne, citro on i'll the, present on the um 
on the Tampa Theater and then let them present afterwards so yeah. that you could take them up. So that, because to your point, um, Councilman Carlson, if you wanted to go there, I would need for a vote to reallocate some of the funds in this current fiscal year. So, and we let's talk urban circulator and then we'll do, we'll make, walk you through what you need to do for the theater should you choose. Do we need to vote on this? Is that Not right, for the only for the urban circulator right now? Well, I just need some guidance from um, on what you would like to do. If you would like to add the urban circulator as a project, you could either t do two things: wait for HDR's um, analysis to come back and what that funding request looks like, so you can structure the funding, or you could create it as a project right now and start to do a set aside um, for that urban circulator. Yeah, what I was right just now. about to say is that was um, Board Member Cicero's proposal, so I'll let him talk to that. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Board Member Miranda. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just, uh, regarding the circulator, I, I would like to do, see the study when it's complete because I've, I've known of some circulators that have done well and I've known others that have not done well. And uh, I just want to make sure that we, we do it the right way and I'm not sure that, uh, that I know enough about it today to vote on it myself. Okay. Board Member Citra. If everyone else... Uh, uh, the reason why I brought this up is twofold. Number one, the parking minimums uh, north, in the north part of town have been reduced. Hoping to get people on public slash mass transportation. But as some of my other colleagues have mentioned, the great things that our CRA dollars have done with the performing arts and with our museum. There are now complaints that people can't find parking spaces and they don't want to walk the extra four or five blocks. The circulator would help accommodate those people's parking in outlying areas and get them to our various attractions downtown. Uh, again, this was to help heart in the public mass transportation within the downtown area. I fear that heart is not going to get the funding that it needs. And my intent was to extend the streetcar, which a lot of people are asking for. A lot of our community, especially in downtown. And I saw this as a pilot project, so that four or five years out, they could be proven that the extension of that streetcar will come. With this, we'll bring more ability for people to afford housing in downtown and work downtown. Again, I can't afford to do this. CRA dollars can help Hart to extend this circulator. The, for, the former circulators were point A to point B. This is going to be covering seven extra miles in a circulating manner. Uh, and I still feel that there is slum and bite in downtown. You go the north of the Zach. North, the north side. Yeah. You go north of Zach. All we have to look at is the Woolworth and Crest buildings. The old Greyhound building. There's still slum of light in downtown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and uh, I, will, I will say uh, that I agree that it would be best um, to wait and see what their study says and what the possible proposal budget is, but uh, I heard one member, uh, uh, board member Miranda talk about that, and I, I agree, so. Um. Can I just make one statement? Yeah. Yeah, yeah if, if the Crest Building counts to justify slum and blight in downtown, then we've got a lot of uh, buildings falling apart in South Tampa. We'll create a, a CRA there. Um, but um, uh, Anyway, um, I, I think I think sometime in the next few years we've got to move some of this money out. It's not, it's 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 not. Um, I mean, look at those numbers. Eventually, uh, wh what's the expiration date? Forty something. Forty two. I mean, if we're if we're getting up around fifteen thirty million just in this one CRA, and that's not counting Channel District. If we moved ten million out per year, we could triple the the pothole budget. Um, and, uh, and so we, need, we, we desperately need money for uh, basic services in the city. And um, maybe we're not able to shut the whole thing down. And I know there's some, some developments that are going on that will need part of it. But if we could take 20% or 50% out, we could really transform with, with 
with $10 million, we could build most of the sidewalks in the city that we want. Um, so I, I would just ask everybody to think ahead once we get past the next two or three years. Thank you. Um, I think that's a wonderful uh, retreat. Uh, uh, yeah, you you, you're on my mind. We're yeah. definitely thinking about the retreat. I think that would we'll be put, fabulous. We'll put it in. Um, <clears throat> Councilman Carlson has, or excuse me, Board Member Carlson has talked about this several times before about um, sunset in certain CRA districts early um, when the work of the CRA is done. When the private sector <clears throat> is going in certain places, there's no need for government to be in that space anymore. So we can definitely have a conversation at our retreat to start looking at which districts you would like us to um, sunset earlier and possibly talk about some of this. So if I can I just say it, it, it because I, I know there's going to be a lot of pushback um, from certain stakeholders about sunsetting. Yeah, but it seems like the compromise could be that we move 20% of it out. And before somebody sends out a press release, I understand that the CRA board does not control where the money goes when it's not in the CRA. But we sit as city council members and we control the budget over there. And we can set up a separate fund or we can allocate it. Um, we may need the mayor's approval also, but uh, there is a way to work out um, a parks fund or a roads fund or a, or a um, public safety fund or a, um, um, or a affordable housing fund, since Ms. Burton's sitting right behind you. <laughs> So we, I mean, we, with, with an extra 10 or $20 million a year and that, and this is, look at that thir $31 million by 2029 and, and the channel district one will probably be 20 or 30 also. If we took 20, 20 million out, that, that would be unbelievable what we could do with that. The idea is for in, at the retreat, we'll bring you um, 10 year budgets for all of the districts so that you can see where they are and for the projects. Cause again, there are a lot of projects in here that are not funded yet that are in the works that you need to plug in and consider along the way. So if I hear you, uh, uh, if there is consensus, you would like to get the HDR study, which is soon, we're expecting it within the next month or so, we could bring you back what that may look like. Um, and, and at that time you could decide whether you want to, how you would like to allocate the $16 million, should you want to do that at all? Is that, okay, yeah? Yes. Board Member Carlson. Uh, without talking about specifics, I know that there are some, there are going to be some requests coming up in the next few years for uh, major infrastructure, uh, road and sidewalk redevelopment and, and infrastructure reallocation in, in parts of downtown. And it, it, you don't have any of that on the budget yet, right? Is it, is if, they're, if they have not been approved by, by the board, they're not plugged into the projects. Okay. We have them listed so that they're in our horizon. I'll go through that with the workshop with you okay, to sh and plug in those numbers. There's also, um, you'll see a forward projection on, even on the Museum of Art. We plugged in numbers try projecting what's coming online. We're doing that with other capital projects. We'll go through that exercise with you um, at the retreat so you'll have an idea of what's coming online. All right, thank you. Are you good with the urban circulator? I believe we are. Okay. Um, seems the consensus is to wait. Um, <coughs> do you want? Does anyone want to move to bring it back, or are you just going to bring it back when it's ready? And you can make them. Um, I would say May. We know that it's. We have like another month um, before well, the study's finished, but I don't know that it will be finished in time for your April okay. meeting. Okay. Well, then we'll we'll wait. Okay. Sorry, just making a note. Um, the next. Uh, one uh, budget that I'd like to go through is regarding the Tampa Theater. The motion was for us to um, outline a budget and possibly draft agreement between the CRA and Tampa Theater. Um, and the Tampa Theater's goal is to fully renovate the building for its 100th anniversary by 2026. So in their ask, um, on the slide ahead of you, you're seeing some of the funding um, that they're having for this project, some coming from the state, some from the county, of the private sector, and then there's a request of $14 million from downtown. Um, the request is broken into $3 million in the current fiscal year, 2023, then $3 million in 2024, and then $4 million for 25 and 26. In your, I had the slides reversed, sorry. So in your, um, if you look on this slide, you'll see the neighborhood infrastructure improvements other than budget line item has $8 million. We, so we can reallocate funding from, I had my slides inverted. 
but you can reallocate um, the three million dollars in your current fiscal year to meet that request should you decide to um, move forward with the Tampa Theater restoration project. So, would, and then in 2024, we would then just allocate it in the budget um, for your budget approval in fiscal year 24. And it will be three million, three million, four million, four million. And you can see that in 20 years 24 through 26 that you can absorb. Um, All that, that was request. in the other slide. Yeah, my slides were inverted. Let me just do this. There you go. <laughs> so it shows that you can absorb that in um, in the budget with just a reallocation, which is on the agenda should you decide to move forward with that. Um, are there any questions for me related to how you can achieve this if should you want to move forward? If not, I'd like to invite the theater up to make a presentation um, to you. They have a separate slideshow mm -hmm. presentation. Item number six, um, please. And then I'll invite John Bell to come up. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is John Bell. I'm the president and CEO of the nonprofit organization that operates the Tampa Theater on behalf of uh, the city for the benefit of the community. And um, I am pleased to share with you today, um, here we go, our plans for the full restoration of the Tampa Theater, uh, which has been at the very center of downtown Tampa. If you literally try to hit the bullseye of the center of Tampa downtown, you'll hit the Tampa Theater. It's been there since 1926. Our timeline is ambitious, admittedly, but we are on a mission to complete the restoration of the theater by the time the theater turns 100 on October 15th, 1926. You can't talk about Tampa Theater without talking about, a little bit at least, about its glorious history. It was built in 1926, designed by the most sought after architect of his day, the theater designer, John Eberson. Um, when it opened, it was considered a modern marvel. It featured the, it was the first public building in Tampa to feature central air conditioning. So that, along with its uh, over-the-top architecture, made it enormously popular. Do you Times have that, change. Do you have that sign, John? I'm sorry. Yep. The cooled, cooled by refrigeration. Do you have that sign still? No, we do not. That would be super cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in... Uh, you know, times changed. In the 50s and 60s, the Tampa Theater persevered, but by the 70s, the theater was endangered. Plans were developed to demolish it. But thanks to the outcry from the community and the leadership of the city of Tampa, Mayor Poe at the time, and city council, um, the city stepped in to rescue the building in 1976. Today, uh, Tampa Theater is widely regarded as the best preserved, most intact John Eberson atmospheric theater anywhere in the world. It is a nationally significant landmark. It's also a building that today is one of Tampa's defining buildings. It, we host, uh, open our doors more than 700 times every year uh, and enjoyed by more than 100,000 residents and vis visitors each year. Uh, the theater attracts a lot of attention, uh, especially recently. We have hundreds of these accolades, but these are some of our favorites. The theater was named one of the 10 most beautiful cinemas in the world by the BBC. Uh, it was named one of the 10, uh, one of the world's best movie theaters by the Motion Picture Association of America. Sundance named Tampa Theater to the first class of North American cinemas to be included in the Sundance Institute Art House Project Theaters. Um, of course, it was registered, uh, put on the National Register in 1978 and designated an official Tampa City landmark in 1988. The programming is diverse. It, it has to be diverse almost by definition when you're opening your doors 700 times a year, but it is dynamic, it's creative, and it's often unique. And we are constantly on the search for new ways to engage with our community and our audiences uh, in ways that are relevant to the current zeitgeist. Uh, economic, uh, the Tampa Theater is an economic engine. It's a catalyst. This, these numbers that are on this slide represent an average year. So again, we're opening our doors 700 times a year, 125, almost 126,000 visitors on average to Tampa Theater in downtown. Almost 13,000 students are served through our field trips, 
summer camps and other educational programs. According to the, um, uh, based on uh, the American for the Arts Economic Prosperity Calculator, Tampa Theater has a direct impact on 246 full-time jobs. Almost $900,000 is generated by Tampa Theater in state and local tax revenues, and we add $5.7 million to household incomes for a, in total in an average year of $8.65 million in economic impact. So we've done um, a lot of work. We've made improvements. We've cared for that building. Uh, we, 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 we have kept it going, and, and obviously we've, we've been met with some success. We had a $6 million campaign in 2017, which we successfully completed on time and on budget. It was the first major uh, restoration work to be done in the building in 40 years. And that phase of work included the most urgent and critical infrastructure needs, like electrical uh, distribution. Um, the lobby was fully restored. We took care of water intrusion issues. We also put in new seats, carpets, and drapes in the auditorium. But there's a lot more to do to this building. It's a big building. It's 38,000 square feet. And we want to make sure that it is uh, well positioned to serve our community uh, in the next century of its life. So this slide shows the sort of two buckets in the way that we're looking at the work to be done. Nicole shared the numbers, which was about a $47 million total. That included the $6 million work that was we've already completed. This is what is in front of us. So we've got two buckets, one for capital improvements, which is the restoration and renovation, and I'm going to go through each of those uh, bullet points there in, in, uh, in just a second. And then the other piece, which is just as important, is the endowment, which we will raise through private sector fundraising, primarily for individuals who will give uh, in their estate plans, planned gifts, that, so that this endowment would be built and grow over time. But we want to go ahead and get in front of those folks and get their commitments sooner rather than later. So if we take each one of these, the first project in this uh, campaign is the second screening room. This is a project that we actually announced in 2019 and then something happened in 2020 that caused us to sort of delay it and caused the world to come to an end. Um, but it was a $1.4 million project. It's now a $3 million project. And that's not because we've added anything fancy. That's just because construction costs have gone up. But I will tell you, this is the game changer for the theater. This changes and improves the business model for the theater. It doubles our ability to deal with film distributors and the demands and the wants that they have for schedules and releases. It also allows us to say yes to more community groups and to book more live events into the historic hall. So this is our top priority. Uh, it is designed and it is ready to go. Um, we talked a little bit about infrastructure before, but there's still a lot to do. This is a building that, again, it's 38,000 square feet. There's a lot of electrical. There's a lot of HVAC work. Although the CRA did fund and helped us match a Federal CARES Act grant in uh, 2021 to install a brand new air handler unit, which was required for us to reopen responsibly, and we're grateful for that. But the, that air, air handler unit is but one of many components of the air conditioning system. This slide shows a picture of the chillers, the compressors that create the cold water for the air conditioning system. Those chillers date from 1968, before there was a term energy efficiency, before that was even a thing. This uh, system is obviously obsolete. Uh, the parts uh, are not on anybody's shelf anymore, so if something breaks and it does break down with alarming frequency, then um, the city has to find uh, someone to make the part, to mill the part. So it's very expensive to maintain. There are portions of the building that do not have central air conditioning. Obviously, the auditorium and the lobby do, but many of the offices on the Florida Avenue side, the dressing rooms, the backstage spaces, None of that is conditioned space, and that needs uh, to be uh, fixed. And, and the, the theater's plumbing, I will say, is sketchy at best. That's a technical term, but it's pretty sketchy. And then the uh, electrical needs, uh, we need to finish those, those uh, pieces. So the, uh, when you say you want to restore the Tampa Theater, the auditorium decorative paint and plaster, that's what most people think of when you say we're going to restore the theater. <coughs> That is, a, that is a piece of it. It's a very important piece of it, but I will tell you it's probably the last project that we will do as we close out this project uh, in time for the theater's birthday. Uh, there is a lot of infrastructure that needs to be integrated into the walls of the building. 
uh, a lot of fiber optics and a lot of uh, uh, electrical work that has to be done, which may require trenching. But we have already done the forensic paint analysis with the team that restored the lobby. We know what the pallet's going to be. And if you think the building looks good now, uh, when the auditorium is restored, it's going to be far more vibrant and it's going to pop. It's, it's going to be glorious. Um, this will require five months of shutdown for the theater in order to scaffold uh, and, and get access to every square inch of that auditorium that the artists need. Production technology, I mentioned fiber optics. You know, in today's world, the uh, touring artists and the streaming content providers and the other sort of clients that we're dealing with, they expect certain things in a modern event facility. We are an analog theater in a digital world. We need to put fiber optic connectivity through, throughout and provide the sort of um, rigging systems, lighting systems, sound systems that, that promoters and producers expect uh, in, in the theater. The trick is that we, we need to integrate it in a sensitive way so that we keep the 1926 look, but the underlying technology, the way the building works, is modern and efficient. Um, so the, uh, uh, the little known to the public is this third floor, which is on the Florida Avenue side of the building. This is a floor that some of you have seen recently, but it's 2,000 square feet. It hasn't been occupied in probably... 60 years, and for good reason. This, this picture is it on a good day. Uh, but it is in terrible condition, and in order to access it and activate it, we need to put it in an elevator, which doesn't exist yet, uh, to, to make the, the facility ADA compliant. So our plans call for this to be built out as an open floor th plan that will accommodate meetings, education, and workshop space with technologies to support content creation and other activities. This is a, this space has tremendous potential for to help us expand our programmatic capacity. And finally, support spaces and other, I know that's a very vague term, but again, it's a very large building and there are a myriad number of non-public support spaces throughout, including backstage, basement hallways, dressing rooms, there are more than 100 doors in the building that need attention, there are storage areas, organ bays, tunnels, and office spaces. All of these items have been neglected for many, many years as we've concentrated on the public spaces, so this will allow us to address uh, the poor condition of many of these spaces. So in total here, we've got, uh, again, back to the, the capital improvements is 20816000 and then the endowment, I'll talk briefly about that and how we arrived at those numbers. So we've got it broken into two categories, an artistic and educational programming endowment of $8 million. Uh, the, the idea here is to take those gifts, park them in an endowment fund where the corpus will never be touched. It will just simply be invested in a way that will earn a minimum of 5 6 or 7% a year. And then from that, we will withdraw 3 4 or 5% a year, uh, so a preservation endowment, what the programming endowment at eight million would generate anywhere between two hundred and fifty and four hundred thousand dollars a year at those rates, and the preservation endowment would generate between three hundred and ninety thousand and six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. This is key because what we want to do is not only fix the building up now, but equip the future management and leadership uh, and this community with the ability, the funds to always take care of this building. Every year we need to be putting something back into that building to maintain it in world-class condition because that's what it deserves. So the benefits to this campaign are that it's going to position the Tampa Theater to be a 21st century building. It's going to make it a far more usable and desirable event venue. It's going to keep the theater competitive with others, uh, with the new technologies that we will be integrating into the building. It's going to increase our attendance, which will mean more visitors to downtown, more footsteps on the sidewalk, and a lot more energy in downtown. It's going to improve the experience for our patrons. It's going to preserve and protect this theater for future generations. And of course, it's going to polish downtown Tampa's crown jewel. So this is the funding pie. It's, uh, again, a almost a $42 million campaign. Uh, the private sector campaign that we will conduct for cash and endowment gifts indications uh, represent 60% of all the funds. We do have a legislative request, bills that have been introduced to fund the theater at the state level this year. Uh, the county has a program. Those numbers are pretty solid, a capital asset matching grant program that we are uh, one of the recipients of. 
So we're counting that dollars as well, and our request to the CRA is for uh, 14 million. So I, 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 that's my presentation, but I can't close without thanking uh, Elise and Nicole and Jeff uh, they are so professional and so responsive. They are rock stars, and they have been very helpful throughout this. And, and so as you consider this, we, we ask for your support, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if you've got them. Board Member Goods. You know, I asked this question when we gave the Stras dollars and cents as well. Uh, maybe Ms. Travis, you can help us out. What, what does the CRA get back out of that? What, what, what type of... I don't use the word center, but so folks can know that the CRA helped you kind of make this dream come through for the Tampa Theater. Well, there will, I mean, if you talk in terms of recognition, yes. I mean, all seven names will be on a, on a, on a plaque in a prominent location uh, to be determined. But, yeah, we, will, we will, are going to recognize the CRA for the contribution, the investment. Uh, I think the larger question is what, you know, what does downtown get? What does the downtown CRA get in, re in return? And, and I'll tell you that, that our staff and our board, we, we have um, come to realize over many years now that all, although we come to work at Tampa Theater every day, and that's our focus, the work that we do is not just about Tampa Theater. This is about, this is a project that's about downtown Tampa and about Tampa and the community that we want to live in. What kind of community do we want to live in? This is a civic jewel. It is an asset that other cities would drool over if they had this. So uh, we're just asking for that kind of support. Uh, it's, it's not an inexpensive project, but we believe the value of Tampa Theater is immeasurable. Councilman, <clears throat> excuse me, Board Member Goods, um, when we talk about investing in um, community assets, you look at the return on investment. So what I would ask, uh, John to talk about is the programming some of the programming that they're yes, doing that is reinvesting okay. in, in our community we've talked a lot about um, having some of our um, underserved communities have access to the theater through programming and we've talked significantly about that so if, if you allow him the opportunity to just talk about that a little bit I think be, that's I'd be happy to why you a rock star. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah. And Jill, I may ask you to come up, uh, our Director of Marketing and Public Relations, uh, and she handles a lot of these program initiatives that, that I want to talk to you about. So uh, our film programming is uh, in two different buckets. We do a lot of new film, which is really interesting these days coming out of the pandemic, uh, but we also do a lot of classic and repertory film programming. One of the most recent programs that we completed was a Black Love series. This was our second year doing this in conjunction with, and I can't remember, Frank, Frank Crum? Frank Crum. Mm -hmm. Frank Crum, uh, where he curated the series. There were panel discussions afterwards. Um, the numbers this year doubled almost the, the series last year. So that was a February series every day and every, every Sunday afternoon, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have a, a, a very popular 30-year-old summer classic movie series where it runs the gamut from, from really old films to relatively modern films. But that is a, that's a key where 700 times a year, or, or, or not 700 times, but that's 700 people every Sunday afternoon during the summer show up at a minimum for these classic films. I think, you know, we, we do a lot of live events. There's a lot of comedy that is being uh, booked right now. We're doing more music events as well. Summer camp is a, is a very strong program. But I think one of the things that I keep in mind and one of the reasons that I became so enamored with movie palaces as a young man is that the movie palace in the 1920s wasn't built for the rich or for the elite. They were built for the common man and woman. So... We remind ourselves of that every day. So our ticket prices for films are very affordable. We are an accessible, affordable venue. Uh, the artist ticket prices for concerts are sort of dictated by the artists, but uh, we run the gamut. So Jill, am I missing anything from, I mean, we, we talk about education programs, films, concerts, special events, lots of community events. Uh, the only thing I would add is, is to, further answer your question about making the building more accessible to more people is the community partnerships that we have. Uh, the work that we do with Frank and the community engagement team at the city 
now has, uh, has manifested in the Black Love series. We're in the process of working on a Hispanic Heritage film series. But we also have these community partnerships with folks like uh, Children and Family Services with the Head Start program. We have a, an endowment from 13 Ugly Men that allows us to invite children and families that can't otherwise pay for those tickets into the building. We have our Park Cinema program that offers free screenings in the community, uh, one of them most recently over in Perry Harvey Park that we talked a lot about today, to make sure that everybody in our community gets to appreciate our programming, not just the folks who walk up and buy a ticket. You know, young people are into a lot of things, when you talk about music, you talk about making videos, you're talking about movies, you know, what, what do you offer as a training program or some type of, uh, I would say, uh, a chance to access to understand how the movie industry works or how the production works, how does the cameras work, the lights, the sound, that's what I'm interested in. If I'm giving dollars when we're saying we're a CRA, I want to know how young people can benefit from that. Yes. To be able to be a part of what we say a city facility and be able to be able to make a career out of uh, movies in, in the cinema area. That is a fantastic question. So right now, uh, one of our most popular, one of our favorite programs that we do is our summer film camp. That's a partnership with the Florida Center for Instructional Technology over at USF, and it's funded in part by our friends at Film Tampa Bay. So it addresses exactly what you're talking about. Kids coming in and having the opportunity over the course of a week to learn how to make a movie, not only from the cameras, the sound, the editing, but also from a storytelling aspect. <laughs> and in doing so, they learn that visual literacy, which is something that we don't talk a lot about in terms of movies, but teaching kids to understand what they're watching, understand the motivation behind what they're watching, understand when they see something, when they see a commercial on TV, what message that director is trying to send. So all of that is included in our summer film camp. Right now, in our current facility and under our current funding, we can only offer that program to 20 kids per session. We offer as many sessions as we can, but it can only accommodate 20 kids. Two or three of those spots every single session are scholarship spots to allow for kids who can't afford to come to the camp uh, under their own power. But that's where that third floor becomes so important. Once we have that space, once we have the opportunity to turn that space into classroom space, into maker labs, once we have the opportunity to have the space and fund the projects uh, that can happen in that space, summer film camp can go wild. We can hit a lot more than 20 kids a session or about 120 what are the, kids What are the summer. age groups we're talking about here? Uh, rising third through 12th grade. Okay, all right. I, you know, I, I asked that question because some of our, our uh, areas in the city, uh, from our parks and rec, they have tried to get like little areas for doing uh, music and things like that, making, uh, CDs and things like that. I, I just wish somehow maybe you could look at uh, in the future maybe partnering with our Parks and Rec and some of our underserved communities get some of those kids in there Absolutely. to see how it actually works. We got scholarship, but I, <laughs> I look at the real groups groups uh, that are really suffering in some of those areas, and I know they're very crafty with their with, with, with their minds and hands to, to make productions. I see some of the things mm -hmm. that they do, so I, I would hope that maybe we can probably look at some of our Parks and Rec underserved communities and maybe have some uh, scholarship or days that they can come and really see how those and see the big bright lights in there, see the stage and see the actual uh, uh, mechanical operation of it all. We work with Parks and Rec on those free outdoor screenings and we can't <laughs> wait to work with them more on something like this. Yep. Board Member Miranda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Bell, thank you very much. I, I listened very carefully for what you presented. I had to leave the room for a couple of minutes. <clears throat> And uh, what you've done, or your, your group has done, is back in the 70s, there were zero people going to the theater because it wasn't working too well. And I think we, $90,000, if I remember, was the amount for the lobby or something like that. And it passed council and, and it, it went on. And what you made it to now, from what I've seen, the, the numbers that you brought up in the many different venues, is something that does give back to the community. And uh, I'm just thinking, when I was a little kid, still a kid in mind, but anyway, I remember it was a Tampa theater, across the street was a Florida theater, then you had the State Theater, and then you had the Palace Theater, and then you had the Park Theater. Mm -hmm. and there was only one theater left. But the others were standard theaters. This was not, the Tampa theater was not then, and it is not now a standard theater. It is a, like an opera house with a lot of beautiful stuff in it. Right. And to make a long story short, I, uh, I asked my friend, my late friend who passed away about three years ago, Dennis Propello, who was a 
fantastic heart surgeon, also head guy with the fabulous rockers, the lead piano player and the, the leader of the band. And I asked him if he would do a concert, just a few, you know, 30 minutes or so, and he said he would do it. So I picked him up one day at the house, and we were, the back door was open, so I hate to tell you, we did walk in. And he had the sound guy with him, and Portello walked up to the edge of the, of the stage and just started talking. And he turned around and told the sun guy, we don't need anything here, this theater's perfect. Without even, he said, just set up the mics the way you always do, we don't need any any new ch changes, we don't need this theater for sound, it is perfect. So if that guy told me that, and he traveled with Frankie Valley, all, Brenda Lee, Connie Francis, you name it, Tony, he never, he, for anybody who was somebody, that, that group went with. And they were the opening act for a lot of, and people in Tampa don't even know that, but th those guys are all fantastic, and uh, too bad that they now are not playing music but maybe we can get them to come back and do something in the theater once you get it fixed up again. They're only young guys like I am. <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Chair. Board Member Citra. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. We had a long conversation the other day, and I'll give you the exact date that I walked in for the first time to Tampa Theater it was July 31st, 1979. I walked in there with a friend who had an extra ticket to go see, and my, my colleague, Councilman Carlson, says that uh, my taste in music is different. It's odd, and I'll admit it, but that first day I walked in, I got to see Blondie and Rockpile. Now, most people don't know who Rockpile is, but at that time, it was alternative music. Since then, I have seen people like Iggy Pop, David Byrne, Zenith Nader, Thompson Twins, recently Joe Jackson, Thank you for that. Um, Thomas Dolby, New Order and Pretenders, all alternative music. I've seen great films like Casablanca and Gone with the Wind. And people don't realize that there are modern films that are now Academy nominated that were shown before they were even put in theaters. I saw one of the greatest transportation gurus in the lecture, Ms. Jeanette Sadakan there. The reason why I'm saying all this is there is not a better venue. And when I say alternative, I mean a place where some of these bands, some of these films, some of these lecturers, some comedians would never be seen in Tampa. This is the only venue that is offered to them. This needs to be saved. This needs to be helped. This is a landmark in Tampa. Lloyd Peterson, Pearson, who's a friend of mine, who is your backstage man, agrees. Modern technology needs to come in so that we can have, keep having these types of bands, lecturers, and movies come in. But I must say that if the hub is still within stumbling distance to Tampa Theater, you will always have an alternative crowd to come see these, <laughs> these movies, these concerts, and these lecturers. Let's save this. Uh, this jewel in Tampa. Oh, if I may, Madam Chair, yes, how did you guys get Bernie Sanders to get in your picture? <laughs> oh, you did catch that, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. You, that was a little Easter egg we dropped in mm -hmm. there. Uh, Jill worked her magic. There was an empty seat in the front row of the last slide. I, I don't know if that can be pulled up. So uh, the meme that was going around, yeah. There's Bernie with his That's mittens. That's how long ago. Remember that meme that was going <laughs> around? I think it was right after the inauguration sometime four years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course. Um, board Member Maniscalco. Thank you very much. I have so many wonderful memories at the Tampa Theater. I don't know where to begin. And so many movies that I've seen there or events that I've attended. Um, but as I was talking earlier about historic preservation, when it comes to theaters or movie palaces in this case, we have demolished so much. We had more theaters in downtown Tampa, the Strand, where Moss Brothers was, the Palace Theater, which is a residential high rise, the Florida Theater across from the Tampa Theater, all demolished. And what's interesting with the 
Palace Theater is that in the 1960s it was converted to a Cinerama Theater, which the Cinerama Theater in Los Angeles, I think, finally closed. I had the chance to finally go to Los Angeles during COVID because flights were very, very cheap and I just wanted to go and see, and it was closed due to COVID, so I never <coughs> had the opportunity, and that's basically the predecessor to what IMAX is today. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was demolished and it's long gone. My mother would go to that theater. My mother would go to the Florida theater, the Tampa theater growing up, and all the movies that she saw. But the important thing is, when it comes to historic preservation, is that we have very few of these movie palaces left because so many went into decline. Uh, they were converted to warehouse space, office space, or just their parking lots today. And we have something so special uh, here in Tampa. The marquee on the outside, everybody recognizes it. You wear it as your lapel pin there, people see it and they know exactly what it is. And when we talk about branding and Tampa, people know what that is. Like the University of Tampa that I mentioned earlier, the minarets. People know the Tampa Theater marquee, the Tampa Theater sign. If you had to recreate that theater today, I don't know if you could, unless you were maybe Disney, how they recreated the Chinese theater here in, uh, in Orlando, uh, at least the facade. But look how special this is. The architect that you've mentioned earlier, um, uh, there's no place like the Tampa Theater. And I've seen this so many times when you see young people or people, you know, kids, like a school bus pulls up and it's a field trip. Or it's adults that go in there for the first time, their jaw is always on the floor and they're going, this is unbelievable. Because you're walking down Franklin Street and it's a plain, you know, whatever, commercial environment. You walk in there and you're transported back in time. You're going back to the 1920s. Um, I know that there were updates uh, recently, not recently, several years ago regarding the seating, the carpet, taking it back to how it looked as closely as possible to 1926. However, these historic structures require so much maintenance because of the detail, the delicate detail um, uh, of everything. The expansion into the second screen that we've talked about next door. The point I'm making, and again, I ramble and I talk a lot. Exactly. It's, we have to preserve this theater, it's so important, because there's nothing else like it in Tampa. We're not going to recreate it. It's not like any other movie palace. Um, you have my total support, and uh, you know, I hope that the council agrees. Board Member Vieira. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 wanna, I want us to be able to find a way to yes on this, and, and I think this is uh, something that's accessible and, and used by all of the community. I know, I mean, I am not going to recount all the times I've been to the Tampa Theater uh, lots of times and, and lo a lot of great memories there. You know, one thing Councilman Good said I do want to build on, uh, which is, you know, if, if we ultimately, uh, you know, move forward with this, finalize this, et cetera, uh, someone should, and if, if someone doesn't, whenever the time comes, I will, you know, make a motion for some of these potential new programs that y'all are talking about um, to come back to us to show us what's happening with our money. And I know y'all would be 100% amenable to that. But I know the, um, the, the film program that y'all are talking about, my son did that a few years ago. It was a really great program. It really, really was. I remember out of nowhere, I come in one day to pick him up and Casey Affleck is there. Casey Affleck, who's a great actor, great director, um, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I'd love to see with this money, just as, as part of it, you know, something tailored towards uh, families in West Tampa, Sulphur Springs, East Tampa, Ybor City, et cetera, um, just to make sure that it's uh, uh, fully accessible um, to, to the extent, and again, I, I say this not knowing if there's any um, ADA accessibility issues that can be improved with those funds, et cetera, you know, building on that to the extent, I, I don't know. I just put, put that out there. Um, but again, th this is certainly something that uh, is uh, very, very positive and, and, you know, looking looking for a way to yes. Let's put let's put it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Board Adventure. Member Carlson. Yeah, just a few more um, comments. Um, I had, I've had one or two kids that have gone through those programs too. And if we have a way that either through the city or CRA we can support the scholarships, we should do that. Um, uh, you know, Brook Brooklyn Public Media spends just Brooklyn spends six million dollars a year on public media and a lot of it is to train people in creating their own YouTube channels and brought and eventually broadcast channels so it's an incubator for technology and and creativity and I know my kids uh, experienced both at, at the at Tampa theater um, it's a facility that's loved by everyone 
uh, you all mentioned a bunch of different kinds of events. I went to a funeral there a couple weeks ago. Art, uh, Art Keeble, you know, who was a great leader of the arts in Tampa, um, was there, and and so we have all these incredible experiences. Also, uh, you know, Lynn Marvin Dingfelder, the the wife of our former colleague, um, has produced several movies. Uh, she did the Goody Goody movie, and we, she just did the La Gaceta movie, and uh, those were screened there. I mean, where else are you going to screen? La Gazzetta and the Goody Goody movies other than Tampa Theater, right? Um, I want to <clears throat> I want to also thank um, uh, Linda Salsena, who's um, a former chair and and uh, advocate for um, historic preservation and the Tampa Theater. Um, Henry Gonzalez was chair many years ago when you all started some of this process. I know you got some current former chairs here, um, and also Charlie Britton, who's been a long, long, long time advocate. I think. One of the three was the first one to come to me years ago and say, you know, somehow we need to protect this in the future. Every couple of years, we're fighting political battles to try to stay alive, and we're fighting for funding. And I think, I think the overall idea with this is to really protect this, the theater for the next hundred years. It doesn't mean that it's going to pay for every new digital technology or whatever comes up, but um, but my goal would be to have you all not barely scraping by. This building, this facility, should never be in danger again. Um, and so hopefully this will protect it um, way into the future. And, and just to repeat again to any of the South Tampa people watching, we can't use this on potholes. We can't use it on the things we want in South Tampa. We can't use it on affordable housing in East Tampa. We can only use it in this district. And so um, this is a, a beloved facility that's used by almost everybody in the community. And I think almost everyone agree that it needs to be protected in the future. Thank you. Yes, thank you again thank you. so much for this presentation and uh, uh, all the things that um, this, uh, this theater represents to the city. Um, I believe Ms. Travis is looking for... Move the resolution, item number 22. Second. You also should move um, item 18, 18 which first. reprogrammed first. 3 million for this year. Yeah, we need both to... Of, both of them, it doesn't matter which order. We can do it at the same time or... Uh, I would do it separately, but they do need to happen. Okay, so, yeah. so which one first? 18 first. 18. Move 18. item number okay. 18. Okay. All right. Okay, motion made by board member Maniscalco, seconded by board member Miranda. Um, we want a roll call? Yeah, why don't we do a roll yes, call? Yes, we'll do a roll call, please. Miranda? Yes. Citro? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vera? Yes. Ms. Calco? Yes. Hurtek? Yes. Motion passed. And then I'd like to move item number 22. Second. Okay. Uh, motion made by board member Maniscalco, seconded by board member Miranda. Roll call vote. Citro? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vera? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hurtek? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> The next we have is an update from um, Elise Drumgo on the East Tampa Summer Youth Employment Program. Thank you. All right, if I may, a presentation for agenda item number seven. All right, Elise Drumgo, for the record, Deputy Administrator, Development and Economic Opportunity. Thank you much. All right, and so uh, before I jump into the presentation, I just want to uh, touch on a couple of items because I've heard the, the public comments and the whispers about the, the program and the approach to the uh, East Tampa Summer Youth Program. And so, you know, the community has every right to, to have concerns about uh, whether or not we'll execute on this. And I'll tell you, the, you know, this, this program is actually pretty near and dear uh, to me once it was assigned to me. And so, you know, I've taken this as the executive sponsor and I've worked side by side by the staff to execute on this. Um, and it, it, this is certainly a cross collaborative uh, process and project and it involves many departments. And so I'll work you through uh, where we're headed this fiscal year in order to meet some of the, the changes that we've been asked to implement, but then also how this might look going forward, okay? So the board asked us to bring back the summer youth program and asked how we might be able to diversify uh, diversify and, and engage and increase the workforce opportunities for the youth. And so uh, this generally does fall under workforce development. 
and um, this program, uh, it, it slots in the summer youth, and we hire 36 youth out of East Tampa. And then Parks and Rec also hires another 12 youth. Uh, typically, the youth are between the ages of 16 and 18. And so I just ask that you keep in mind that we are working with minors as we work through this process, OK? Um, part of the, the efforts here are for us to, to really provide those career development opportunities, but then to bridge the gap between the city and the citizens by providing this training. Um, we looked at uh, some ways, too, that we could potentially add to the labor pool for some of the hardest to fill uh, entry level positions. And so that's what we'll be doing this fiscal year. And I'll explain to you how that moves forward uh, for next fiscal year. And so what we're proposing for you uh, here is a phased approach, uh, a phased approach to improving this program between this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Okay, and so for this fiscal year, we're looking first to hire a, a temporary coordinator that will come in and work with us so that we can take some of this off of our CRA manager's plate because he cannot uh, circulate to implement this program and keep track of all those youth. And so the temporary hire will also give us the added resources for check-ins and provide a little bit of uh, certainty to the future user groups as we build out uh, that program uh, that I'm referring to. Uh, for and being able to embed the youth into the department. So we will have some departmental immersion and some positional exposure throughout this uh, first summer as we work up to ramping up the program. Okay. And then we're looking at our programmatic adjustments for fiscal year 24. Uh, you know, part of this process is to uh, have the youth work in advertised positions that reflect actual roles that are available within the city of Tampa. And it takes time to build out those job descriptions. And so what we're doing now is we'll build out those job descriptions, and then we'll advertise those job descriptions when the positions open up. I can tell you the current hiring cycle, it already started in December. And so the job descriptions that were pre-existing, we have to hire in for those jobs. But as we go through this process, uh, we'll integrate the new job descriptions, and we'll be able to have some department-specific work experiences and in addition to that, we'll have further immersion and embedment into those departments, okay? So uh, just to give you a sense of where we are and where we sit and some of, some of the additional steps that we need to take, and, and please keep in mind, as I mentioned, it is a cross-departmental uh, collaboration here. And so what we really need to do is to firm up our job descriptions and then work with our human resource, our legal department, and risk to make sure that we have all bases covered for uh, integrating minors into the workforce because, as I mentioned, the, the age group 16 to 18, right? So we have to make sure we have that worksite compliance. And so at this time, we'll be requesting uh, approval from the board to be able to hire a temporary program manager to come in to work with us as we continue to build it out. I can tell you that the, the staff that I've worked with to do this and uh, Administrator Wynn's team, you know, we collectively have about 75 pages of curriculum that, um, that we, we didn't have before. You know, this program used to operate and folks just went along uh, throughout the years and so now we've built this out. And one of the things that uh, came up for us is, is, is really having that coordinator that can, uh, that can check in with the youth. And so we think that uh, in doing that this year, this helps us ramp up. It helps us with the circulation on the immersion as well. And then that coordinator can keep track and then we can continue to build on that. Um, building on this program is something that mirrors what we've done with other uh, youth programs as well. So uh, just keep that in mind when we look at uh, the ramp up. Uh, but then ideally, you know, what we're asking for from you all is to allow us to bring back the program in final form in September. Because again, keep in mind that this is a, uh, it's cross-departmental, it is cross-functional. That gives us the time to review everything with our legal, our human resources, and our risk team. We'll have our job descriptions, we'll be ready to go. And then, as I mentioned, the hiring process typically starts in December. Okay, so as we ramp that up, we're looking to, uh, to have a, a great kickoff this summer on the immersion, and then next year we should be uh, fully operational. And so between now and September, we'll continue that work. We'll continue to build the program out with the program coordinator, and we'll uh, pilot that immersion process, and then we'll finalize our guiding documents and have that back to you. And hopefully we'll have some feedback from our participants, the parents, and some of our uh, work teams uh, in September as well. We'll have that for you. So um, I'll stop and I'll stand for any questions. Board Member Maniscalco. 
Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I received a, a phone call this morning. You were talking about misinformation, and the person said, you know, this can't just be about picking up trash. And it's a lot deeper than that, correct, as you've explained. Um, what other opportunities are going to be there? If it's not, you know, this picking up trash, but, you know, tell me, like, what's, what specific things were there, will there be? Sure. So uh, this year we're actually looking at, so for this fiscal year, we're looking at getting the students out to engage with some of the user groups to do tours of, uh, it could be water utilities, distribution. Uh, some, some of it is human resources. We also have commitments from our development services team. So it could be working with inspections, understanding inspections as well. Um, so it is, it is across the city. This is, this is not something that we're uh, limiting solely to solid waste. And our goal is actually to build out the job descriptions that reflect those specific department uses. So uh, some of them will be working with us in the redevelopment agency as well. And will this allow, I mean, obviously it's to possibly inspire them for future careers, but will there be a pathway saying somebody, you know, partook in this um, employment program, would they have the opportunity in the future to say, that's where I want to go to work in the future. Hey, I have this on my resume. I'm not just, I, you know, I have a better understanding. Yes, and part of the, the role of the coordinator is actually to act as a coach, right, and to be able to share how those skills may transfer. But you're absolutely correct, Councilman. It, it really is about us getting the students exposed to the jobs and then them being interested in performing those functions in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Of course. Board Member Goods. You know, <clears throat> we, we've had conversations, and I know it's been tough for you, but it seems like you're making a little progress now. Uh, the last time I talked about it at our last CRA meeting, and maybe the administration heard me. So, uh, again, I won't be here, but I'll be watching. I'll, I'll come before that, where you at right now, if I don't think it's, it's moving right, and I'll say something, because I want to make sure that the kids in our community have an opportunity to see what the city does, be able to have an opportunity, a pathway to employment. You know, we've had some young people who worked in our code enforcement, summer program and they've become, uh, got on our, our, our uh, enhancement team. But it's, you know, and, and that was a good phase for those particular persons, but it ain't for everybody, you know? So we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to grow and to be able to see something different. Uh, I know me, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not, uh, what in the old days you call nice nasty. I think Ms. Connie Britton probably heard that word before, nice nasty. I'm not nice nasty, but, I know I, I'm not a son kind of guy. Like I said, when I came home from college and my dad said, you're going to go over with your Uncle Joe and you're going to pull concrete, mud. And that lasted one week for me. That lasted one week for me. That wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. So I, I know certain things ain't for everybody. So I'm glad that uh, you're trying. I know you're having a difficult time. I'm just hoping that you'll keep the fight, make sure the program is viable for our young people so they have an opportunity and hopefully the, the foregoing council will monitor this and make sure they're getting opportunities. But I thank you for your work. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman. And, and, and if I may, I just want to make sure that, you know, it's clear that we are, we are collaborating on this. And, you know, we had a huddle uh, to really discuss this with the department heads as well with, uh, you know, chief of staff was at the table too with our human resources director and some other administrators along with our legal team. And so, for us, you know, my challenges have come with all the hats that I have to wear and wanting to make sure that I shepherd this through to the end. And so, you know, the staff that's been dedicated to this, they've pulled together uh, quite a bit and it really does, it just has to be vetted. And I think that, um, you know, we're at a 60% process when you think about project management and we do need the time to be able to finalize it and make sure we have all the checks in place. Um, I just want to say, as the maker of the motion, um, I appreciate the update. Uh, I'm really excited to see what the kids are going to be able to do next year. I'm, uh, it's, this is not just a summer job, but it's a summer job with the idea of what, what entry level jobs there are, and I would just, I, I'm just, just for the public and for our own edification, can you share maybe some of those entry-level jobs that uh, 
that you're ha that that can be difficult to staff that we might be able to get youth in. Sure. So I wouldn't. I don't have a list of those at this time, uh, Chair, Madam Chair. But I can certainly I can follow up with you and give you some information on some of the challenges that we experience across all the departments. And I'll follow up with HR and see if I can get your report. Okay. I appreciate. Sure. I mean, I just didn't know if you knew off the top uh, what are some of the some of the areas, but. Um, the goal is to make sure we're getting the kids out of just picking up trash. And so I appreciate the effort that's going toward this. And I look forward to more updates, even before September, on maybe just uh, where, where we stand and how we're, how we're doing. Um, the summer program is over in August? August, August. that's correct. So, well, that's why you want to come back in September. Hmm. So I was going to say, I'd like a, maybe a mid-update in July. To sure. Yeah, well, I mean, we can do a midpoint update and let you know how, you know, by that point we should actually be finalized with documentation, but we should be looking at some of the feedback from, yeah, from our coordinator and from the participants. So I, th I think that's I really what I'm looking for, and that sure. would be July 20th. We, so we have a motion from board member chair uh, Hertak, second from who was the second? Uh, Council member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. But I, it sounds sure. like you also need a motion. I do here because we we are asking hire. we're we're asking to be able to hire that so we'll part time second. coordinator. Thank okay, you. I have a motion by board member Good, seconded by board mem member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and I just wanted to make a quick note of the time. It is 12 o'clock. However, mm -hmm. we are almost to the end of our agenda. Do we feel, is it okay to, to soldier on? Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we can get it done in yeah. 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Courtney Orr, your EWAR CRA manager, is going to um, report on item number eight for you. Good morning. Courtney Orr, EWAR City. I'm seeing the corrected document. Let me get this. Oh, okay. Um, you're going to get a corrected document. You had received a memo previously after uh, uh, responding to the motion that was made about supporting the Cuban Club building. So uh, there was just a correction made in the memo you're being handed right now, which was the Cuban Club has actually requested a $2.5 million appropriation from the uh, state of Florida. However, they have not learned the results of that. So I just wanted to make sure that um, that was corrected within the memo. And they discussed, or Patrick Montega, who is the president of the Cuban Club Foundation, and I discussed the intent of them possibly asking Hillsborough County um, for additional funding to support the exterior building repairs that are needed. Um, however, has not made that. We have not made that request yet. Otherwise, everything else is exactly what um, was discussed in regard to the outside work that the Cuban Club would like addressed that, that is adjacent in the right away of the building. And so I've met with city departments, uh, ADA coordinate, the ADA coordinator, and then mobility representatives to try to address what, what would fall within their wheelhouse and whatever they might be able to assist. Um, also, in addition to providing information on the grant funding that's available through the Ebor City CRA. So it's moving forward. Discussion still happening. Okay. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, I, I would just like to make a motion to ask you to discuss this with the CAC and come back to us. Uh, when would be a good time to come back? It, I could put it on the... Um, the March agenda, the late March agenda. Oh, the May. Right, so I'm in, on, on our March agenda, so that oh, okay. April. Okay, yeah. so that whatever that. Sorry, April thirteenth. April thirteenth. So okay. okay. So to discuss this with the CAC and bring back their advice and recommendation on April thirteenth. Second. Okay, I have a motion made by Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up on the agenda is agenda item number nine. Uh, it's a report on a discussion between uh, DGM and the CAC reference to uh, accessory dwelling units and the process for recommendations. And I think there was some desire to talk about monies available for programs as well. 
And so uh, staff submitted a memorandum along with, an, with a presentation. And uh, you know, uh, Director uh, Stephen Benson and I, we actually attended this CAC meeting to have this discussion and presented. And I can just give you some of the highlights of that discussion. Uh, we talked about current ADU regulations, differences between ADUs and extended family residences. We also talked about uh, the need to align for more ADUs and how that fits into comp comprehensive plan policy. Um, there was a lot of discussion amongst the CAC and the general public about uh, ADUs because there were thoughts that ADUs could be utilized to help with affordable housing and affordability. And so the residents were concerned that they would be capped out if they were to adopt ADUs at some point and they would not be able to reap the generational wealth benefits if that were something to be implemented. But ultimately, uh, we ended uh, with the understanding that, you know, this is something that council still has to take up long term. And I think that you all collectively have to make some decisions about accessory dwelling units where you'd like to see them. And those will be ongoing discussions throughout the year. And we really don't have any funding dollars or programs available right now to be able to fund ADUs because those discussions need to happen by this board as a council. And I'll stand for any questions or comments you may have. Board Member Moran. Just for clarity, uh, the yes, funding, sir. if the ADUs, uh, the property owner A got a, a house up front and got uh, a lot on the side or whatever, and, and there's one that fits there that meets the setback requirement. I guess you're going to require the setback the same as you are in any house. Am I correct or not? Uh, there, there are specific land use regulations or, you know, guiding yeah, ADUs. I, yeah, I believe in the land development code there are some, you know, there are regulations that allow you to have structures, accessory structures closer to the property line. I don't. In, in different areas. Yeah, different areas. Yes, correct. Yes. In different communities. Yes. I, I agree with that. And, and uh, are they going to have, I don't know, I mean, you're just bringing it to us, and are they going to have separate meters? Are there going to be one meter from the main house of that one or separate meters? Or Well, well again, uh, Councilman, I, or, yeah. excuse maybe me, I'm ahead of myself. Member. Well, not necessarily, but there are just, there are regulations in Chapter 27 that define how ADUs and how extended family residences are, uh, how, how they're treated and how they're regulated and, and how they're governed. And if you all would like to see that change, I think we'll continue to have those conversations. And so... You know, collectively, I think that's a, a discussion for you all to take on it. And I agree with that. I think we should have a, a continuation and, and find out exactly what it all is because the public is hearing us and they don't know either. And uh, it, it's time that I think that if we have a serious <coughs> look at these things that you, you, your aide, or, or Ms. Travis should be uh, presenting to the, the board what you think is necessary and how to do those things and whereabouts and the funding. Uh, I don't know how that comes about, but I guess whoever the property owner. Well, and I think, I think part of what Mr. Drumgo is trying to say is a lot of this conversation needs to happen as you all sitting at City Council, because right. you all need to make some decisions about how the Land Development Code treats ADUs in, in, in the I city as a whole and in different areas, yeah. if that's how you all want to yeah. proceed. So that's that needs to happen. And then, you know, where the CRA can make, potentially step in is if ADUs are an acceptable alternative and it can be a way that could provide additional affordable housing, then maybe we can structure a program to provide or help people, uh, you know, construct ADUs or rehab accessory dwelling units for that, for that yeah. purpose. So. Yeah. And, and collectively, you all have asked that we continue to have community conversations and do additional research about ADUs, and so <coughs> staff has continued to host uh, workshop sessions. And, uh, you know, I think that we'll, we can come back uh, later at a workshop with all the other uh, housing-related uh, potential items or impacts and I know that's something that's on hold as we work through our housing needs assessment thank you absolutely if, um, if there are no additional questions we can move yeah. to the uh, yeah uh, board member Gutes, do you have any additional questions on this this was your item okay okay great all right. Uh, well, now we're on to the required approvals. Uh, the next agenda item is uh, item number 13. It's a West Tampa CRA CAC reappointment of Carlos Ramirez as a representative of the North Hyde Park Alliance. This will be his fourth consecutive so term. Moved. Second. Um, I have a motion by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded up by Board Member Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
right? <coughs> the next item uh, for approval is a resolution to purchase a single family residence in West Tampa at 1940 West Spruce Street for a total of $423,000 together with, and that's with the closing costs. Uh, the home is a three bedroom, two bath, approximately 1,500 square feet. The West Tampa CRACAC recommended acquisition at its regular meeting on January 24th to support affordable housing initiatives. So moved. Sir. Motion made by board member Miranda, seconded by board member Goods. Um, roll call vote. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Citra? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vera? Yes. Ritek? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. All right. The next item on the agenda is the Tampa Heights Riverfront CRACAC appointment of Justin Rick as a committee member. This will be Mr. Rick's first term. Second. Uh, motion made by Board Member Goods, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. The next item on the agenda, item number 16, it's the East Tampa CRA uh, program change for the Skill Center. So at your regular meeting last month, the, the board approved the funding agreement. And so this request is actually a reprogramming of dollars to be able to meet that funding commitment in an amount of $500,000. So second. A motion made by Board Member Good, seconded by Board Member uh, Miranda. Roll call vote. <coughs> Citra? Yes. Carlson? Goods? Yes. Vera? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. <coughs> Miranda? Yes. Vertec? Yes. Motion passed unanimously. All right. The next item uh, is item number 19. It's a resolution uh, approving the assignment and, and assumption of a facade grant agreement to another entity. Um, they've created another entity, and so this is just uh, codifying that change with an effective date. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion made by board member Maniscalco, seconded by board member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion okay. carries. All right, and the next item is a resolution, and it is approving a lien subordination uh, of the CRA. And so this is uh, tethered to the previous item where the CRA is subordinating its position to allow for uh, financing of a loan in the amount of $500,000 to that entity. And so we would just uh, be switching our position on it. And so this moved. is typical. So moved. Second. Okay, motion made by board member Maniscalco, seconded by board member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? Okay, motion carries. The next item is number 21, and it's a facade grant uh, with a nod to exceed $50,000 for uh, Old Cigar Factory at 2111 North Al Albany Avenue. Uh, the private investment on this project is just over $104,000, and staff recommends approval. So moved. Second. Motion made by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded by Board Member Miranda. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That's the last item, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, do we have any uh, information and reports? I'll start with um, Council, no, I'm sorry, Thank Board Member much. Miranda. No, ma'am. Thank you. Board Member Goods. Board Member Citro. No, Madam Chair. No. Board Member Maniscalco. Board Member Vier. Believe it or not, I've got a few, if I may. I never make uh, CRA motions, but I, I know, but I do um, today. Um, one, I, I'd made a motion on veteran housing, and it was suggested that I request that um, when uh, staff come back with a report on uh, using some of the funds for our veterans, that they look at having a specific percentage dedicated to veteran housing, so I want to amend um, when that's coming back to us to to uh, look at that uh, percentage, um, and I don't know when that's coming back to us. Um, April thirteenth is the next meeting, but it may not be that day. Okay, um, but I'll I'll just amend it, and then and then if I may, Brandon will, uh, if you don't mind, Brandon, uh, sending a memo uh, for that to amend it, if I may. That's my motion. Motion made by Board Member Vieira, seconded by Board Member Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, second, if I may, uh, we, we just passed that Tampa Theater. I want to come back in a year, because we're in, that'll be just before summer, um, to see what the plans would be on the um, film camp for, um, for uh, communities, if we can schedule it a, a year into the future. Second. 
Motion made by Board Member Vieira, seconded by Board Member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And, and thank motion you. That would, and, and thank you. That would be the meeting in March. Um, and then lastly, I want to motion for this to come back in, let's say, in June of 2023. Um, for CRA staff to see on what help, if any, they can get either through grants, um, uh, you know, existing programs, et cetera, for the Ebor History Museum, because they've been having some okay. challenges. That will be the board retreat? Yeah, can we or the, 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 Oh, so, okay, July. So July, July 20th, then. Yeah. My apologies, that's my motion, Sorry. thank you. Okay, motion made by Board Member Vieira, seconded by Board Member Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nothing else, thank you. Okay, Board Member Carlson. Uh, sorry, a couple real fast here. Um, Nicole, do you know if we have, uh, or somebody know if we have the Ebor bricking coming up? Should we, can I, if not, can I schedule it for just an update on that for April 13th? Okay, I'd like to just um, get an update on the proposal to rebrick uh, 7th Avenue on April 13th. Okay, um, motion made by Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion Thank carries. And then uh, um, further to the Tampa Theater, I'd like to have um, staff come back um, to uh, give us an update on the renovation and activation of the co-work space at Tampa Theater to, to come back on June 8th, uh, September 14th, December 14th, and um, March 14th. Second. Well, can, you, can you say that again? Um. I think it's March 14th. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to get do it quarterly, but instead of just saying quarterly, I wanted to put the dates out. For the theater? Or? Yeah. Oh, or for Tampa Union Station. Did I say uh, Tampa Theater? Okay, Tampa Theater. Sorry, I'm sorry, I mixed up the two. Yeah, so uh, to give an update on Tampa Union Station renovation and activation of co work space on June 8th, September 14th, December 14th, and March 14th. Again, June 8th is that um, retreat. Oh, sorry. July, what? 20th. July 20. Okay, July 20, September 14, December 14, and March 20, March 14. Second. Okay. Motion made by Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So same Motion thing. I'd carries. like uh, just to come back for an update on the Tampa Theater renovation on July 20, September 14, December 14, March 14. Second. Okay, so motion made by board member Carlson, seconded by board member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. And lastly, okay. thank you. Lastly, um, I know this is CRA, but uh, today is the two-year anniversary of the passing of um, Officer Jesse Madsen, and just would like to send condolences to his family and to his colleagues. Um, you know, he was heroic in saving lives um, in putting his life in harm's way and lost his life saving us. So just wanted to thank, every, th uh, thank his family and his co-workers for the sacrifice he made. Thank you for that. Um, okay, motion to Move receive, to receive and follow. Second. Okay, motion made by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Aye.